<laughs> we, we will start in a, in a couple of minutes, but I would just want to invite anyone who feels comfortable to move further to the front. Last, yesterday we had some rows reserved for VIPs, but several of them will not be here today, so please move forward if you want. So, welcome all back to the second day of the Green Industry Conference. Uh, I hope you all had a good night and uh, it's good to see you all back here again. We, today we will start with the, the winner's circle, clean technologies and innov innovative business models. Uh, this panel discussion will be moderated by Neil Gunn who you've been seeing here earlier. Uh, and I'm pleased to invite the speakers up on the stage. Uh, the speakers are Mr. Reinhard Joes, Managing Director, BIPRO, Germany. Mr. Sena Peris, uh, Senior Expert on Policy Development uh, from Sri Lanka. Ms. Jaruwan Kamruang, uh, Director, GROW, Thailand. Ms. Ploy Chat Chanok Viria Tompan uh, from Thailand. And uh, Mr. Andres Briqueno, co founder of Fab Lab Santiago, Chile. So please give them a hand and uh, welcome. Thank you, Marit. Good morning. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming.
coming to this early, early session in the, on the second day of the conference, but I see we have quite a number of uh, colleagues joining us. Uh, the, today's uh, discussion will be about innovation. As you would uh, remember from yesterday's keynote, uh, Professor Godfrey uh, mentioned and uh, described innovation uh, and investment as the core pillars for green industries and circular economy approaches. So we wanted to uh, bring together a different kind of type of innovations, innovation processes, uh, and uh, the systems that have helped these innovations to come up together. Today we have uh, two colleagues, uh, Reinhard and Sena, who will be talking about uh, business model innovations, particularly chemical leasing. We have uh, uh, Jarawan and uh, Poli Chanuk, uh, who has a nickname, Tom, so <laughs> I will call her Tom, for, uh, engaged in product innovations, green products, and we have, we, not last, last but not least, uh, all coming all the way from Chile, uh, Santiago Fablab. Andre, Andres uh, Briseño Gutierrez. Uh, I, I t tried your, to say your name a few times this morning. And he will be talking about uh, basically process innovation, but uh, through a new entity that has come up in the uh, fast-paced new uh, environment that we are living today. So without further ado, I'd like to give the word to Reinhardt and start the presentations. We, I would like to recommend that you limit your presentation to five, six minutes in the first round, and then we will go uh, uh, for another round to clarify, and then we will turn to the audience and uh, for their questions. Please, Reinhardt. Yeah, thank you very much, Nilgin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope the presentation starts. So um, this is the winner's circle, and I have the pleasure to introduce to you an innovative business model called chemical leasing, what provides a triple win business situation. In this early morning, this is something like you get a strong coffee, a good tea, and a fresh orange juice all together in the same way. And how this works, I will try to briefly introduce to you. The new approach of chemical leasing is you do not longer pay for the amount of chemicals, you pay for the benefits of chemicals. What is your interest if you are using chemicals? Your basic interest is not to become the owner of a chemical, you want to have the function, the benefit of the chemical. If you need to do cleaning, you want to have a clean surface and you don't want to become the owner of kilograms or tons of solvents. So the idea is you pay for the benefit, you pay for the square meters of clean surface, for example. And this has now an effect that uh, supplier of the chemical does not sell the amount, he sells the function. That means he gets his money per square meters of clean surface. And what is the consequence? The supplier all of a sudden is now interested to provide as little chemicals, as small amounts as possible to the process because he gets money for the clean surface, not for the amount of chemicals. In the classical business, he gets more money if he sells more amounts. The more you sell, the more you earn. Every salesman knows it. But if he gets paid for the benefits, and he can reach the benefits with less chemicals, it's better for him. 
And this is the strong motivation, the innovation behind, because this generates an added value that results of a smaller, lower use of chemicals and of a close collaboration between the two partners. And that's what we mean with a triple win situation. The supplier of the chemicals has a better profit because he needs to provide significantly less chemicals to his client and is paid for the benefit, what still means a significant amount of money for him with significant lower costs. That means better profitability. It's like the strong coffee. For the user of the chemicals, he also benefits because in his process less chemicals are used. That means his costs go down and both partners can share the economic added value. A win-win situation between the two partners. Both are motivated, both have same interest in the same direction. In the classical business, the supplier or the manufacturer wants to sell as much as possible and the buyer wants just to buy what is necessary. In chemical leasing, both parties profit if less chemicals go to the process. And that's new, and that's innovative, and they collaborate in an even better way. And you see on the other side, and as this is a business model, it's a logical consequence, there's an environmental benefit. Because as all are motivated to do the job, to do the process with less chemicals, also less chemicals go to the environment, there's less air pollution, less waste load, less water pollution, and of course, reduced risk use. Let's call it that's the fresh orange juice, what's provided by this business model. Just one example. I already talked about metal cleaning. What you see on this slide is a standard situation, how much solvents you need to remove 100 kilograms of oil from a metal surface. And you see the open machines, which we find in many developing and transition countries, uh, would use around 700 kilograms to do these cleaning tasks with air emission of 520 kilograms and waste of 230 kilograms. In several countries, legislators said, that's too much, that cannot be true, and say, by legal obligation, have foreseen that this cleaning is only done in closed machines. And you see how it could be reduced significantly from around 750 solvents, kilogram solvents, to 160 cam kilogram solvents with less air emissions and less waste. And then comes this business model of chemical leasing, close collaboration between the partners, and you see, we are on the way to 15 kilograms, and latest examples show we are doing the same job, exactly the same cleaning task with four kilograms of solvent going into air emissions, one kilogram and waste three kilograms. And what is really striking and innovative, the supplier of the chemical that is in this case providing four kilograms is making better profit than in the first case where he is providing 750 kilograms. This is a striking, innovative approach of this business model. Unido has supported the development of this business model in various sectors. So we have uh, more than 100 successful pilot projects around the world. This goes to powder coating, where you pay not for the kilograms of powder, but you pay for the coated surface. It goes to agriculture, where you don't pay for the kilograms of pesticides, but you pay for a hectare of land free of pests. It goes to water treatment. What is the benefit of the chemical? It's a purified water. So you pay for the cubic meter of purified water and not for the kilograms of chemicals. It goes to labeling processes and many, many more. It's just a few examples what has been achieved so far. And in all cases, triple win. Better economic position for the supplier, better cost and economic position for the user, and environmental benefits. It does not need a lot. Once 
the partners start with this business model, they see the advantages and it's running without a consultant, without further government. Just the key question is, and this is also related to the poll, how to kick it off, how to make people aware of this business model. In the last slide, um, uh, you see what is available to kick these processes off. So you need to have provided websites, toolkits, brochures, a lot of material which is free of charge, which interested suppliers and interested users can apply, can use, and have the benefit and see the experiences others had made with this new business model. And there is policy support. You see a picture here with uh, the Director General of UNIDO and Ministers of countries that signed a joint declaration on chemical leasing where they provide promotion, awareness and policy support just to disseminate this model to make users and suppliers of chemicals aware. I think that's it for the introduction and I hope uh, in the discussion you can enjoy this triple situation in the early morning. As I said, coffee, tea and orange juice, you get it all. Thank you, Reinhard. Uh, let, me, let me mention uh, the countries you mentioned that supports uh, this program. This program is not new. It, it has about uh, one and a half, nearly one and a half decades of a past. And the countries that have supported it have been uh, Austria, Germany, and uh, Switzerland. We, we thank them a lot uh, because this has also been a pioneer. It's a, a product as a service model or a paying for performance model. So you don't pay for the product but for the service that it provides. It has been a pioneering uh, business model that has found its way into circular economy because it's exactly about circular economy but it has been started uh, about 15 years before we started thinking of circularity and we are grateful both to our donors, uh, development partners, uh, our partners to UNIDO and the, the firms uh, and other stakeholders that we have been working with for, for promoting this model. Now, we have an example uh, from uh, the agricultural sector, how uh, pesticides could be, uh, what kind of results we get from pesticides and chemical leasing. Please, Sena, tell us about uh, what you have been doing in Sri Lanka in about five, six minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Nirgul. Good morning. Uh, First of all, let me thank uh, UNIDO and National Clean Production Centre Sri Lanka for uh, inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, we started chemical leasing uh, as a concept in 2008 uh, with the newspaper printing company uh, where we managed to have a significant saving which prompted us to go for the largest sector in Sri Lanka, the agricultural sector, uh, because we felt the usage of agrochemicals, pesticides, pesticides, uh, and also chemical fertilizer is quite large. So the, the idea was the agriculture sector and the plantation sector, where tea is one of the key uh, crops, hmm? we decided that we will work with them. But we had a problem with the agriculture sector. All our agriculture, plant, agriculture fields are, farms are fragmented small-scale farmers, not more than 10 hectares in one, uh, if you take one. So is the vegetables as well. Also, our agriculture was dependent mainly from imported agrochemicals. We don't produce anything, and it is distributed right around the country through a retail network. So whenever there is a problem with, uh, a, f uh, with a pest problem, the farmer goes to the, the retail shop and asks, what is the solution? And the retailer gives the, the best solution he can because he gets the highest benefit. Not the best solution for the field, but best solutions for him. Then farmer takes this agro agrochemical and then he applies. He doesn't um, 
he is skeptical about always the the retailer he doubles the dose and we selected as a result of that uh, one vegetable farms as you can see the the potatoes uh, we decided on actually starting with the potato farm and in that one we managed to convince the the farmer but we had a problem we didn't have a supplier so we had to invent or create an intermediate person called service provider consultant who will support the farmer and who will recommend what are the chemicals so the chemicals are bought by the farmer so by doing that we managed to overcome the problem a barrier we had because we don't have a manufacturer supply in the country so now we started with the farmer the farmer had to one hectare the one hectare we divided into two portions and the two portions in one portion he used his conventional way uh, where he applied the pesticides also other chemicals every 6 days every 6 days he applies uh, and this is a period of 4 months and uh, in a, in between if there is rain he will apply the the pesticide the, the dosage application again so it's a quite a heavy uh, in involvement and also the labor requirement for the application in the the chemical leasing the the portion of the the farm we used the service provider to look at the the farm we had one trainee to work with the farm every day so he took photographs he mailed all the photographs to us we looked at and the service provider also looked at them and he recommended don't apply anything and when it is necessary he say now is the time to apply the farm applied based on that and by doing that by the end of four, i think the four months we managed to bring down many actually get many benefits the i will show in the next slide we reduced the the pesticide application all the chemical application by 40% and also the the involvement of labor was reduced which was not quantified in addition to that there was a surprising thing even we were surprised there was an increase in yield 11% increase in the yield so and this particular project won a bronze award in 2012 and uh, and also we applied the the same way to the plantation industry with a company called finlays a large manufacturer of tea manufacturer uh, and through that one again we used the the another chemical they were using weedicides more than the pesticides the weedicide application uh, they managed to bring down uh, and they, usually the tea cycle is 4 years so when we started in 2013 we managed to find out that uh, there is a reduction but we could not quantify but by 2017 we managed to quantify there is a significant reduction but unfortunately in between there was a Uh, restriction by the government the pesticide or the, sorry the weed side was banned so as a result of they found it was be difficult to continue but we had a significant uh, reduction but at the early stage because of the work they did they won the bronze award again in 2014 for their work and as i told you the potato cultivation we had a reduction of 40% and also 11% increase in yield maybe we can i mean talk about it later in the second round the how we got this 11% yield increase so this was prompted and as a result of that several other applications were there for carrot plantation then we applied it for the paddy our major staple food uh, sub supply and in both occasions we managed to get the significant reduction in application of pesticides and weedicides and also an increase in the yield we never had a reduction in the yield now we have gone into another area the waste water treatment of course uh, the Na national clean production center is actively involved and mas is a, a large uh, manufacturer of apparels and textiles and they are one of the world leaders and uh, i'm proud to i'm proud to say Sri Lanka is actually at the top in the apparel manufacturing and uh, they have certain conditions they are supposed to have 
zero liquid discharge, zero waste load discharge by 2020. So first of all, they decided to go for chemical leasing to reduce the amount of uh, the chemicals in sort of treatment, which uh, they have done the trials. You can see the MAs, uh, the holdings, the linear Intimo as well as Nord Lanka, both are companies under them. They have gone with uh, two different companies. And uh, these uh, projects are now successfully implemented. One challenge we have, by 2020, we have to make zero liquid discharge. So definitely, the, it will be, now at the moment, it per the one cubic meter of treated water. But 2020, it will be per one cubic meter of water delivered to the factory as clean water for in the, the process. So they have started with this, and I believe uh, we will have very successful results with this one. So both these companies are now selected for the final round in the, this year, 2018 Chemical Leasing Awards. So I think this is the happy news. I can tell you more details later. Thank you. Thank you, Sena. Uh, so uh, we will come back to, for another round, but let us introduce all the ideas, the new innovation, innovations on the stage. Now we go on to, from business model innovation to product innovation. Uh, the uh, two firms that we have on the stage have been winners of the Global Clean Tech Awards, which uh, uh, UNIDO, the it is a program, Global Clean Tech Program, at the end uh, awards uh, successful companies. Uh, it's, uh, it's running in uh, more than 12 countries right now and we expect to uh, expand it. It's in partnership with Jeff uh, and uh, we wanted to uh, learn from the experiences of the two Thai companies that have uh, benefited from this program and won the awards, and they have their products on the market as well. Please, Jurawan, please tell, tell us about Grow. Yes, thank you very much. May I speak Thai? If you have, uh, would like to ask more information, uh, you can ask after this. เอ่อผลิตภัณฑ์ของเรานะคะก็คือเป็นบรรจุภัณฑ์จากกระดาษฟางข้าวซึ่งบรรจุภัณฑ์ของเราที่ทําอยู่ก็คือเป็นบรร
เราไม่มีการใช้สารเคมีที่มีความเป็นพิษในกระบวนการผลิตซึ่งปกติแล้วในกระบวนการผลิตกระดาษจะใช้สารเคมีในกระบวนการผลิตและโรงงานอุตสาหกรรมกระดาษเป็นโรงงานที่ก่อมลภาวะเป็นอันดับ3แต่ว่าในการผลิตกระดาษจากฟางข้าวของเราคือเราไม่ได้มีการใช้สารเคมีที่มีความเป็นพิษในขนาดเดียวกันมันเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ที่มากกว่าเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ที่สามารถย่อยสลายได้เพราะว่าด้วยตัวของฟางข้าวเองเมื่อย่อยสลายก็สามารถเป็นปุ๋ยบำรุงดินได้นอกจากนี้ผลิตภัณฑ์สัมผัสอาหารของเราที่เป็นกระดาษแบบสัมผัสอาหารได้เรายังใช้สารเคลือบกันน้ำกันน้ามันที่สกัดจากเยื่อฟางข้าวเช่นเดียวกันคือในกระบวนการผลิตตั้งแต่วัตถุดิบจนถึงผลิตภัณฑ์เป็นนอนเคมีข้อร้อเปซและในการทําเป็นบรรจุภัณฑ์แบบสัมผัสอาหารได้เราสามารถกันน้ำน้ำกันน้ํามันได้โดยการใช้เยื่อจากฟางข้าวไม่ได้ใช้สารเคมีในการเคลือบซึ่งคุณสมบัติกระดาษตอนนี้ที่เราทำเป็นบรรจุภัณฑ์แบบสัมผัสอาหารได้สามารถที่จะกันน้ำกันน้ำมันได้ในระยะเวลาสองชั่วโมงค่ะแล้วก็มีความแข็งแรงสามารถใช้งานได้เทียบเท่ากระดาษปกติทั่วไปแล้วก็สามารถที่จะปริ้นหรือว่าออกแบบดีไซน์เป็นแพ็กเกจจิ้งที่ดูทันสมัยได้ค่ะซึ่งในการทำกระดาษจากฟางข้าวเราเห็นว่าเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ที่เป็นการพัฒนาแบบยั่งยืนก็คือหนึ่งเราทำงานร่วมกับชุมชนค่ะเพราะว่าเรารับซื้อฟางข้าวจากเกษตรกรซึ่งปกติแล้วฟางข้าวหลังฤดูการเก็บเกี่ยวก็คือชาวนาจะเผากันแต่ว่าเราอยากที่จะทำให้เขามีไรายได้เพิ่มแล้วก็อยากกระจายกระจายไรายได้ให้กับเกษตรกรดังนั้นเราก็เลยรับซื้อฟางข้าวจากเกษตรกรโดยตรงค่ะอันที่สองก็คือ,อในกระบวนการผลิตของเราเราไม่ได้มีการใช้สารเคมีที่มีความเป็นพิษดังนั้นนอกจากจะมีความปลอดภัยต่อผู้ผลิตเองแล้วผู้บริโภคแล้วก็โลกของเราก็มีความปลอดภัยด้วยค่ะแล้วก็เราสามารถที่จะสร้างรายได้สร้างงานขึ้นในชุมชนเพราะว่าด้วยตัวของเราเองเราก็อยู่ต่างจังหวัดเพราะฉะนั้นเราก็ลดอัตราการว่างงานของคนต่างจังหวัดและลดอัตราการอพยพเข้ามาทำงานในเมืองหลวงของคนต่างจังหวัดได้ค่ะและนอกจากนั้นเรามีการทำงานร่วมกับพันธมิตรต่างๆที่เป็นองค์กรทั้งภาครัฐแล้วก็ภาคเอกชนในประเทศไทยค่ะซึ่งตัวผลิตภัณฑ์ของเราหลังจากที่เราได้ไปร่วมโครงการเข้าร่วมโครงการกับ Clean t e ทมาแล้วทำให้เราสามารถพัฒนาต่อยอดเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ใหม่ๆซึ่งตอนนี้อยู่ระหว่างที่เรากำลังสเกลอัพให้เป็นธุรกิจค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ Thank you Thank you John Before proceeding How did you learn about the global clean tech uh, program? You said you were outside Bangkok, far away from Bangkok. How did you learn or hear about the global clean tech? Uh, we know the news about global clean tech from the internet. And we had the opportunity to come and work and work on an exhibition in Kroon Thep. We saw the information about the information and we were able to get the answer from the winner who was the winner of the year. Okay, the production of our production will be able to get into the clean technology because we have the opportunity to use the technology to use the technology to use the technology. เข้าร่วมโครงการก็ทำให้เราได้ตกผลึกทางด้านความคิดจากตอนแรกก่อนที่เราเข้าร่วมโครงการผลิตภัณฑ์ของเราอาจจะไม่ได้เพอร์เฟกร้อเซนแต่ว่าหลังจากที่เราเข้ามาร่วมโครงการทำให้เรามีการพัฒนาต่อยอดแล้วอีกอย่างต้องยอมรับว่าการที่เราเป็นสตาร์ทอัพที่เป็นอินโนเวชันเราอาจจะมีความรู้เฉพาะด้านแต่ยังมีความรู้อีกหลายๆด้านในเรื่องธุรกิจที่เรายังไม่มีความเชี่ยวชาญแต่หลังจากที่เราได้มาเข้าร่วมโปรแกรมแล้วทาให้เราสามารถเติมเต็มความรู้ที่เราขาดไปได้ค่ะ Thank you. Now we go on to uh, the next firm, Tom Kasawa. Please, Tom, tell us how you have started and proceeded and what you're doing now. Thank you. Ka, สวัสดีค่ะพอยจะสนุกนะคะชื่อยาวมากขอก็เรียก
คุณต้อมแล้วกันเราเป็นหัวหน้าทีมของต้อมคัสวานะคะในส่วนของต้อมคัสวาเนี่ยเป็นบริษัทที่เริ่มจากการดําเนินการจริงๆทีมของเราเป็นทีมวิทยากรที่เหลือเวลาแล้วเราก็ลงมาช่วยเกษตรกรอยู่ประมาณ10กว่าปีเราก็จะรู้จักธรรมชาติของเกษตรกรกลุ่มนี้นะคะเราเห็นปัญหาของเกษตรกรต้องยอมรับประเทศไทยเป็นประเทศที่ต้องยอมรับเป็นประเทศที่ผลิตอาหารระดับต้นๆของโลกไปนี้ฉะนั้นก็เลยทําเรื่องเกษตรเยอะเกษตรเยอะก็จะมีตัวตัวใครวัสดุเหลือใช้ทางการเกษตรเยอะแยะไปหมดเลยทุกวันที่เราเฝ้ามองเราก็จะเห็นการเผาโดยความไม่รู้ของเกษตรกรสิ่งหนึ่งที่เราพยายามจะเข้าไปให้ความรู้เขาว่ามันต้องลดการเผาแล้วเพราะว่าปัจจัยหลักของเราเป็นนิพัยธรรมชาติมันเกิดจนเรารู้สึกเราก็กลัวนะคะแล้วสิ่งเหล่านี้เป็นสิ่งที่ทุกคนจะต้องรับรู้ว่ามันเป็นหน้าที่ของทุกๆคนบนโลกใบนี้บนวัสดุชาติทุกคนจะต้องรับรู้ช่วยกันแก้ไขนะคะเราก็เริ่มคิดนวัตกรรมนะคะว่าจะทํำยังไงให้เขาหยุดเผาสิ่งที่เกษตรกรเขาต้องการคือหนึ่งคุณบอกให้เราหยุดเผาหยุดสร้างอีวิชั่นต่างๆเนี่ยคุณมีอะไรชดเชยเราไหมอันนี้มันเป็นเป็นปัจจัยของมนุษย์โลกเราทั่วๆไปนะคะเราเคยบอกว่าไม่เผาได้ไหมเขาบอกว่าไม่เผาแล้วอะไรล่ะเพราะผมต้องใช้พื้นที่ปลูกพวกเราต้องใช้พื้นที่ปลูกเราก็ใช้เวลารวบรวมคนที่อุทิศตนกับสังคมอยู่กลุ่มหนึ่งนะคะเรามีอยู่สิบกว่าคนทีมเราก็เริ่มคิดกรรมเรื่องเตาเตาเพื่อจะเรามีการค้นคว้าเรื่องแอคทิวิตี้คาร์บอนก่อนนะฮะว่าอะไรที่มันจะมาแทนที่แอคทิวิตี้คาร์บอนจากเดิมเนี่ยมันเป็นไม้ไผ่ซึ่งไม้ไผ่เป็นไม้ที่ให้ออกซิเจนสูงมากนะคะเราก็เสียดายใน3ปีมันมีคุณค่ามากกว่าที่จะไปทําอะไรได้มากกว่านั้นเราเห็นกระลามะพร้าวสิ่งที่ได้ก็คือผู้ประกอบการได้ไม่ได้ถึงเกษตรกรโดยตรงเราก็เริ่มคิดแล้วจะไปทํายังไงเอาเทคโนโลยีตัวไหนมาใช้ทําแอคทิวิตี้ให้เงามันสำหรับมันเกิดมูลค่าขึ้นได้นะคะจากนั้นน่ะเราก็เริ่มเราก็เริ่มนํามาทํามาทํานะคะนะคะเอาตัวเง่ามันเราถามเกษตรกรทำไมถึงเผาเนื่องจากตัวเง่ามันจะเป็นตัวกลางอะฮะอยู่ระหว่างเป็นตัวยึดระหว่างหัวมันกับต้นมันนะคะตัวเนี้ยถ้าเอาไว้ในไร่มันเนี่ยเขาก็จะเกิดมันเลื้อมันเลื้อภาษาเนี่ยคือว่ามันจะไม่มีผลผลิตมันจะมีแต่ต้นแล้วมันก็จะไปแย่งอาหารจากต้นที่สมบูรณ์ฉะนั้นต้นที่สมบูรณ์ก็จะแอบอ่อนแอตามไปนะคะอ่อนแอตามไปเราก็เริ่มการจัดการกับมันเดิมที่เกษตรกรจะต้องจ้างเก็บออกไปทิ้งนะคะเอาไปเผาทิ้งเนี่ยจ้างแรงงานประมาณต่อตันคือ150บาทคงต้องไปคำนวณเป็นเงิน US กันเองนะคะแล้วเราก็เขาได้1นึ่งร้อยต้องเสียงเงิน150บาทเราบอกว่าเฮ้ยยูไม่ต้องเผานะคุณไม่ต้องเผาละคุณเราจะให้เงินคุณอีก3อีก4เท่าประมาณ600บาทคุณเอามารวมไว้หยุดการเผาเราให้รางวัลกับพวกคุณนะคะเราก็เอามาแปลรูปเป็นตัวเอติวิตคาร์บอนขบวนการของเราที่เอามาทำเนี่ยซึ่งปีหนึ่งอะเราคํานวณละประเทศไทยเนี่ยไปพื้นที่ปลูกประมาณ10ล้านไร่มีผลผลิตส่งออกนะคะเป็นอันดับหนึ่งเรื่องมันสำปะหลังเนี่ยอันดับหนึ่งของโลกนะคะเรามีหัวมันอยู่ประมาณ30ล้านตันเรามีตัวคาสวาสตัมตัวเนี้ยประมาณ5ล้านตันถ้าเขาเผาอย่างนี้ไปเรื่อยๆเราจะทําเฉพาะกลุ่มเนี่ยเกษตรกรกลุ่มเนี่ยจะสร้างตัวคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์เนี่ยประมาณ15ล้านตันต่อปีเราก็กระบวนการจัดการเราก็เริ่มแบ่งเซกชันเนื่องจากทีมของเราเนี่ยเป็นทีมวิทยากรที่ลงทุกจังหวัดที่มีการปลูกมันสำหลังคือ52จังหวัดของประเทศไทยเนี่ยปลูกมันสำหลังเรามีทีมที่กระจายเนื่องจากว่าเรามีองค์กรภาครัฐสัมสุนเราอยู่แล้วไม่ว่าจะเป็นกระทรวงพาณิชย์กระทรวงเกษตรธนาคารเพื่อการเกษตรเนี่ยนะคะเราก็เริ่มไปให้ความรู้กับเขาร่วมรวมตั้งจุดต่างๆแล้วก็ทําวิเคราะห์พร้อมกับการทํางานวิจัยอีกทีมไปด้วยกันนั้นจากนั้นมาเราก็ได้ผลิตภัณฑ์พอเราเราเริ่มเราเริ่มได้ตัวเอ,อเอามาทําเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ละเรารู้ว่าคุณสมบัติตัวเข้ามันกลับเป็นสิ่งที่ดีกว่าตัวอื่นได้จากว่าตัวเนื้อไม้เบาบางมันเป็นไม้ที่ตัวคาร์บอนซัมเนี่ยเป็นไม้ที่8ปดถึงสิเดือนนั่นเองฉะนั้นการใช้ความร้อนนะคะความร้อนพันกว่าองศากับความเร็วในระยะสั้นเนี่ยไปทะลุทะลวงเขาเนี่ยสามารถเปิดพื้นที่ผิวในการดูดซับได้ดีมากก่อนหน้านี้เราก็ไม่ได้มีเทคโนโลยีอะไรเราพยายามจะช่วยชาวบ้านโดยการเอาตัวคาสวาซัมเนี่ยไปนะตัวเง่ามันสำหรับไปช่วยให้ไปขอร้องให้กับหลายหลายเตานะคะที่เขา
ได้ได้ตัวแมทเทเรียนออกมานะคะเป็นคุณสมบัติที่ดูดซับได้ดีแล้วเร็วเหมือนกระดาษชิชูอะค่ะนะคะเราก็เริ่มทําครั้งแรกเลยก็เริ่มทําที่เป็นตัวดูดกลิ่นก่อนเราก็ส่งตัวดูดกลิ่นไปทดสอบกับเราโชคดีที่มีพันธมิตรที่เป็นโรงงานโพลิไบต์โพลิไบต์ได้เป็นโรงงานผลิตน้ํายาพวกเคมีต่างๆเนี่ยในการอับสอบกลิ่นต่างๆเนี่ยปรากฏเขาตอบรับได้ดีชุมชนรอบข้างนั้นเขาไม่มีกลิ่นออกมาเลยเขาก็อยู่กันได้นะคะเสร็จเราก็ลองมาทําสบู่ปรากฏว่าสบู่ของเราเนี่ยก็ได้คุณสมบัติที่ดีดูดซับนะคะพวกกลิ่นสารเคมีต่างๆได้ดีเรากําลังทําโครงการกับสารุงสารุสังหวัดเนื่องจากว่าที่มีปัญหาเรื่องเคมีต่างๆเนี่ยจะเห็นข่าวในสื่อต่างๆที่ว่าใช้ฝุยเคมีเวลาชาวบ้านลงนาไปแล้วก็เกิดปัญหาที่ว่าตัวเคมีติดเท้าขึ้นมาแล้วจนปัจจุบันด้านเน่าจนถึงกระดูกเราอยากจะลดในเรื่องของสารสุขของประเทศเรานะคะเราจะทําสบู่สู่ชุมชนให้เกษตรกรได้ใช้หลังจากขึ้นจากนาจากไร่แล้วมาฟอกตัวนะคะเรามีผงล้างผักอีกตัวหนึ่งซึ่งตอนนี้กําลังมาแรงเรามีพันธมิตรก็คือบริษัทประสาททองโอสดกลุ่มประสาทองโอสดแบงกอกไอเวเนี่ยเข้ามาเป็นทำไมดิคือเห็นในสิ่งที่เราทําเพื่อสังคมก็เอาตัวผงล้างผักเราทํา OEM ให้นะคะไปแช่ล้างผักเราจะดูดซับสารเคมีต่างๆหรือแม้กระทั่งอีโคไลที่มากับปุ๋ยอินทรีย์เนี่ยประมาณ9ก้าสิบกว่าเปอร์เซ็นต์ซึ่งเราทําวิจัยร่วมกับทางมหาลัยมหิดลนะคะเรามีสายแมวที่ทําวิจัยร่วมกับต่างประเทศนั่นคือสามารถคนที่เลี้ยงสัตว์เนี่ยต้องอยู่ด้วยความอยู่ด้วยกันอย่างมีความสุขก็คือดูดซับมันสามารถจะดูดซับได้ดีคุณไม่อยู่เนี่ยพวกกลิ่นต่างๆในห้องจะไม่มีมันจะดูดได้ดีค่ะกลุ่มนี้สิ่งที่เราทําทั้งหมดเนี่ยสิ่งเราได้คือเราต้องการคือข้อแรกคือลดภาวะนะคะพาเรือนกระจกนะคะเ,เหมือนกับตอบสนองสนธิสัญญาณนะกรุงปารีสคือไม่อุณหภูมิสูงขึ้นพยายามให้มากที่สุดนะคะเราสร้างรายได้ให้เกษตรกรให้มีรายได้แต่ละคนต่อครัวเรือนเดือนละ1 0 0 0 0 0ถึง 40,000 บาทนะคะในขณะเดียวกันเราจะลดเราสร้างกําลังซื้อให้เขาตอบแทนกับในรูปภาษีมาใช้จ่ายต่างๆเนี่ยเงินกลับมาพัฒนาประเทศของเราเองนะคะสิ่งสําคัญที่สุดคือเรามีผลิตภัณฑ์ที่เอามาสร้างคุณภาพชีวิตให้ดีกับคนในสังคมค่ะขอบคุณค่ะเท่านี้ก่อนนะคะเกตนี้ Thank you, thank you very much, Tom, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, just uh, to clarify, it, I, it, the the product you have your earphone. Just to clarify, uh, the product is now in the market, is it? Is it? And is it? I, are you making? I have you started making profit? คือจริงๆต้องเรียนนิดนึงนะคะเราเพิ่งเริ่มต้นตอนที่ครั้งแรกที่เราทำเนี่ยเราอยากจะเผยแพร่โดยไม่ได้คิดตั้งทำธุรกิจพอกลับมาถึงจากการที่เราเราเป็นวินเนอร์ปีหนึ่งหของประเทศไทยเสร็จเราไปต่อที่แลนเจลิสที่งานแข่งที่คินเทคนะคะเราได้แลนเดอร์อัพกอบอมาเนี่ยเราพอกเรากลับมาโดยโปรแกรมทําให้เราต้องทําธุรกิจเนื่องจากว่าเราชอบเรารู้สึกขอบคุณทางคินเทคบอกทางดูดีโดบอกว่าอยากให้เราแสดงตนว่าการที่คุณทําเพื่อสังคมรากายขนาดเนี้ยคุณน่าจะทําให้คนเขาเห็นว่าการทำเพื่อสังคมอ่ะมันไม่ได้กินอุดมการณ์อย่างเดียวคุณสามารถทําเป็นธุรกิจได้เราก็เลยเริ่มกลับมาเซตทีมเมื่อประมาณเ,าเดือนอมีนาเรากลับมาเซตจริงๆเดือนมีนานี่เองแต่พอเรากลับมาสิ่งที่เราได้ได้คุยได้เผยแพร่ออกไปเราได้พันธมิตรเราเราได้เพื่อนที่ดีมากหลายๆท่านเราจึงเล่นทําเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์วางตลาดปัจจุบันนี้เราก็มีลงในห้างบางห้างแล้วก็ทางเว็บไซต์เมื่อวานนี้เราได้การตอบรับจากห้างท็อปซูเปอร์มาร์เก็ตให้เราไปวางในห้างซูเปอร์มาร์เก็ตทั่วประเทศแล้วค่ะแล้วเราก็มีโครงการของ Seven Innovation ซึ่งอยากให้เราลงในเซเว่นต่อจากนี้ไปค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ okay. Thank you because you mentioned the, about the research and development and then you mentioned the testing on the ground uh, uh, and now we understand you have found partners so you are uh, you have gone through the different steps of Innovating, uh, finding the idea, and and then how you putting it into practice through different steps. Uh, we would like our audience to think about these uh, steps and how how innovation can be uh, supported and encouraged. Now we come before we come to the discussion session. We come to the Fab Lab example. Uh, Andres, uh, please tell us uh, what 
Fab Labs is about and what you are doing in Santiago. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, um, I would like to say that when, when we see the logo of UNIDO, um, we're seeing a different way to observe the globe. And that's something pretty interesting for me because this uh, conference or this moment is um, an instance to, to talk in a different way. Um, in order to do that, I would like to present something very quickly in a very short time. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to exp uh, explain what does it mean a, a fab lab. A fab lab is a, a kind of uh, open and a physical platform that uses uh, digital fabrication techniques to make things, okay? And to provide people uh, technology uh, to trying to get solutions uh, related with the context. Today, we're a network that is based on uh, an, at MIT, where more than uh, 1,200 different fab labs around the world. And uh, uh, our fab lab is uh, based in, in Santiago, Chile, and it's related with a foundation called Distributed Design Foundation. Um, I would like to start uh, with this slide, which is trying to express something that is, I mean, it's related with the circular economy concept, but I would like to say, I prefer to say that a circular economy concept is just another trend. I mean, there's many trends happening right now. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, third industrial revolution, a sharing economy, orange economy, blue economy, or whatever. The thing is that something is happening. And it's not related with the industry only and the economy only. Economy is just a very thin layer of reality. The fact, according to us, is that some things are changing because uh, uh, the way that we're being related as a people is totally changing. We're coming from a centralized or, or an extremely centralized relationship back in the first industrial revolution, and now we're living times where people can be connected with uh, knowledge, uh, with new tools, with a new perspective of make things. So I would like to express that all this scenario is more related with a sociocultural transformation which is something totally open right now. It's liquid. We don't understand where we are going to be in the future. So the thing is that, according to us, uh, a concept that can collect uh, or gather the uh, energy of this is a distributed scenario. And the main concept related with distributed is, uh, a distributed scenario is that people, it's getting more autonomy from the market, bit by bit. And the status quo is not understanding the process. Uh, it started back in the 90s, probably, uh, but the thing is that bit by bit, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're having more access to things that before or decades ago was impossible. Does anybody understand what does it mean to study at Harvard today by free? Uh, it's something crazy when you think about it. So the thing is that we're, being, we're, we're bit by bit uh, uh, enjoying, let's say, the autonomy as a concept. And the industry needs to understand that in order to create new business models. Uh, uh, the relationship with uh, uh, consumers are totally different right now. We're talking about users. We're not talking about people that there's just buying things, because people can do things in different places of the world. Uh, so according to do that, in our, in our case, we're trying to understand uh, through design what are the new principles to, to design among all these transformations. So um, we call it distributed design. So we identify 
more or less six principles related with all these transformations. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, a design, it's having a transformation related with a systemical approach. We're more oriented with a systemical, let's say, um, approach than uh, an object approach. Uh, a, a second uh, principle is that the ownership is uh, being, uh, or is having a dispersion of the own, own ownership, okay? Um, then we have a potential prosumer active co-creation process among all these transformations. People can do and affect all the things that are um, on the market. At the same time, we're seeing an emerging presence of uh, a, a prefix related with self something or self organization, self government, self something, you know, it's related with autonomy. Uh, at the same time, information valuation is increasing uh, more than the matter in itself. We can spread information all around the world and to make things. It's not about the matter, it's about the information. And this is one of the key concepts of design. And at the same time, totally related with the circular economy, is that we are having, or we have to, to, to uh, create a critical approach of the Anthropocene scenario. Uh, because if we, we don't do that, nothing is going to change. So just a quick, uh, or a very short um, list of examples that we're working in, in Chile and the region for instance, this project is related with um, technology where providing uh, devices, stationary urban um, you know, devices and mobile uh, devices to allow people to uh, participate in some um, in, 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 uh, in a specific region in Chile. Uh, so we're following the different situations that are coming from the people. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not working properly. Um, uh, and the interesting thing about this is, is that we're collecting data, but at the same time, we're collecting data from the people. Uh, so we create pattern, uh, we're, we're understanding patterns of behavior of people using technology to improve democracy channels, let's say. Um, another example, maybe it's more interesting for this, uh, this panel, uh, it's Machinario. This is an, an emerging design platform and e-commerce working, uh, and I mean, it's, it's available uh, in, in all, all the world, but the thing is that we gather designers from different uh, regions to design products using digital fabrication, fabrication techniques, and we're selling the products, okay, on demands. But the thing is that we're selling the information of the design as well. So people can fabricate all these products here because you are buying just a file. So we're selling information. Um, another example is this one, which is trying to prove that we can create um, a distributed manufacturing technique. Um, it's a, a, a technique that can uh, 3D print objects into um, sand, uh, let's say, landscapes. So we're using sand as a media to make things, you know? So for instance, uh, this is just a prototype, but, but we're controlling the shape of all the outcomes. So uh, we can create bricks in different places because we have a small infrastructure to create these uh, small pieces. Uh, but the concept is, the good, interesting concept here is the distributed manufacturing technique. Um, and at the same time, just to finish, uh, we have, for instance, three different uh, research spaces in our organization. Uh, one is a Materium, which is an open biomaterial platform uh, in order to understand the different materials or raw material that you have in different parts of the world, so you can uh, predict how you can do with these materials, and we can play um, you know, doing biomaterials, uh, something similar to these examples, and uh, we're, pr we're providing uh, a recipe for people to make things, okay? It's designed at the end, it's something related we cook, to cook, you know? 
we're cooking things, you know. Uh, at the same time, we have two examples totally related with the circular economy concept, uh, of course, related with design, and uh, ornamental is a circular economy advancing contemporary jewelry, um, you know, space. So all these jewelry examples are made by uh, all textiles, you know, we're using this, this as a raw material to create, in this case, jewelry, it's a manifesto, of course, and object textile is a circular economy textile research at the same time, so we're creating some uh, machinery and technology to uh, use textile as a new uh, raw material. So uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. You mentioned uh, something very interesting, I, which I want to pick up and ask you. You mentioned about this dispersed or distributed ownership. One of the things that we know in this, I think, in this room from an industrial perspective, we have a whole global system of protecting, protection of innovations. Protecting the innovator is basic to, it's a market. In itself, we have the patents, trademarks, and it's a global system with the assumption that unless we can protect the rights of the innovator, uh, the innovation landscape, the innovations cannot flourish. So how does the Fab Lab and what you have said about distributed ownership particularly fit with that or is that going to also change? Thank you. Um, it's a very complex question, uh, to be honest. <laughs> um, we're, we understand that uh, we're uh, in the middle of uh, a transformation, a sociocultural transformation. Um, um, the business model that we're proving or we're trying to test right now related with this is that um, for now, uh, if in the information um, is a very strong, let's say, business model base. My point is, when you have a car, for instance, very expensive, and you uh, have an accident, uh, the car, uh, the cost of the car is, is nothing after this accident. So the cost of the car is the information embedded in this car. So, for instance, Machinario is uh, we're selling the information of this design in a very short price. So we're collecting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, chances to get money just to sell the information. Uh, but we're, uh, uh, the, the feeling of the ownership of this innovation is uh, related with the people. So um, uh, in our experience, uh, it's something that is not clear for now, how to get that moment. But but it's a good moment. I mean, uh, we're not afraid about it. And, and we need to be very honest about it. We don't have uh, the uh, final answer. We're living in a moment very liquid, you know, like extremely liquid. Remember when in the night this discussion about the ownership of the music uh, industry? Everybody wanted to stop the process of Napster but afterward, nothing happened because you can control the autonomy of people. That's the, that's the point. So we're trying to, uh, you know, explore. We're trying to research about. And then maybe in, the, in, in a couple of years, we're going to, to get the final solution. But, but at the same time, the status quo, the government, are, they're not so related with these changes. So we're kind of uh, outsiders. <laughs> Now is a good time to turn to the audience. Can you show the questions that we got? Uh, have you... Uh, let, me, let me announce again the Slido. Can you put up the slide? For those who are just uh, joining us, you can go to your mobile phone's browser and uh, just write www www.slido.do and uh, 
log in to, with the conference code and you can send us your questions. <coughs> we will take the questions that have come. Can you please show now the questions? Uh, I have to look at it from here. I'm sorry, my e eyes are not good enough to... But this is not working today. Okay. If you allow me, I will go down and look at the questions from here. Yes. Good. Better. Uh, which policies? Okay, let's uh, let's that uh, let's take that. Which policies and strategies help each innovator? We have the chemical leasing, we have the global clean tech, we have the fab lab. So you have all been supported by someone, something, some institution. Uh, maybe Reinhardt. What kind of an environment? Uh, helped chemical leasing to come up as an innovation and flourish. Please. Yeah, um, thank you first for the question and I think the key point for the chemical leasing is really awareness. Um, partners around the world need to know there is something what you can do different and so Someone is required that communicates this message. And in this case, interesting enough, the message was communicated by the policy area. So uh, environmental ministries and UNIDO started to tell companies how they could do better applying chemical leasing. And uh, this was a new type of dialogue industry very, was very astonished that such an initiative came from ministries, but it helped a lot and industry very much appreciated in Europe and in other areas that uh, policy makers are not just presenting new lim limit values, new restrictions to chemicals, but a concept how to do better, how to contribute to green industry, how to increase profits. And the key point was, and still is, that these concept is communicated, that small and medium-sized companies, that companies in countries that are not participating in conferences, in fora like this, get to know there is a new way of doing business, doing business more efficient. So I would say this awareness raising initiative was really the crucial point. Okay, uh, how, uh, just uh, very quickly though, how do, how, what is your suggestion for better dissemination to SMEs. This has been going on, chemical leasing, we've been promoting it for nearly one and a half decades. It has not gone through the environment like uh, fire, if I may say so. You mentioned 100 good cases, but what is 100 good cases in so many years? What is holding up, taking up of this, and how, what we should do? Um, we need the governments in those countries where the SMEs are located. If a German or Austrian government is making some announcement, is having a nice website, this message does not arrive at the SME in Thailand, in Laos, in Bangladesh or in other countries. So we need these governments that know their SMEs. We need the industry associations in these countries to take up the message, to take up the message and translate it in the language of the country, in the language of the SMEs of these countries. And I think this is, has been mentioned several times yesterday. Co collaboration between the countries and communication in the right channels that finally arrive at the SME level will help to further disseminate oh. and continue success stories like we have heard from Sri Lanka. Th thank you. Uh, Sena, how, what, uh, how can, can you tell us the interface between industry and agriculture and uh, what do you think uh, should be done to promote the, this new business model throughout? 
Uh, yes, uh, but one, just before actually uh, answering that question, uh, we had a, a problem in Sri Lanka, which is common to most of the developing countries. We don't have chemical manufacturers, pesticide manufacturers in the yeah, pesticide manufacturers in the country. Right, and uh, the therefore the supplier and the the, manuf the the user, we cannot have a direct link. So what? We have to do in our countries, we have to have a strategy where we have an in intermediate person, a service provider, who can do the job of the supplier, recommendation and also control in the, the supply. So now coming back to what you asked, in, uh, if in a country like ours, uh, the, most of the industries are agro-based. So if agriculture and the government also has taken a decision many years ago, to make it uh, low input agriculture, we, are, we will reduce the amount of agrochemicals used, even the chemical fertilizer used. Now it are going to even organic farming, but which is not a reality at the moment, so we are going for that. So there are many service providers in the industry sector and also the post harvest uh, industries. We have a huge market for the, the low input products, the less pesticide products, even export products. So the, the industries can benefit from the, the suppliers who apply chemical leasing, where they are, the, the produce will be having less residuals of uh, pesticides and weedicides. Thank you. So for the business model to be taken up, you are proposing the awareness raising, both of you are pro promoting awareness raising of the chemical suppliers, in this case, the chemical, because it's, the, it's chemicals that we are talking about, awareness of the buyers, the particularly SMEs, whether they are small farmers or small businesses, and some research and development and policy support. That is what I have understood from both of you. Now we go to the product innovators. You, you have a... Uh, a specific uh, to Kun Jarawan. You have a specific question. A colleague is asking whether your product is competitive and how much it costs. Where did it go? Okay, how much it costs for one food box? You don't have to ex tell that, but can you tell us whether your product is competitive, please? ก็ขอบคุณมากค่ะสําหรับคําถามค่ะซึ่งเอ่อในตัวราคาของกล่องใส่อาหารนะคะอันนี้อาจจะต้องขออนุญาตเรียนว่าถ้าสมมุติว่าอยากจะทราบจริงๆอาจจะขอเป็นหลังจากเวทีนี้ค่ะเ
ค่ะอ๋อตอนนี้เรากําลังทําพืชตัวอื่นเพิ่มนะคะตัวส่วนตัวต้อมเนี่ยนอกจากคาสวาแล้วเนี่ยเรากําลังมองได้ว่าเนื่องจากประเทศไทยนะคะทางภาคเหนือเนี่ยทำพืชเกษตรเยอะมากแล้วก็มีปัญหาเรื่องเปลือกข้าวโพดนะคะเปลือกข้าวโพดที่มีการเผาทําลายกันเยอะทางภาคเหนือจะโดนปัญหาเรื่องขึ้นแบ็กซีรีสตลอดเวลามีเปลือกข้าวโพดมีตัวใบสับปะรดพวกนี้หลังการเกษตรเขาค่อยเผาเรากําลังจะเอามาทําผลิตภัณฑ์บางตัวในส่วนของแพคเกจจิ้งด้านนอกแต่ด้านในสามารถใส่ชาเขาเข้าไปเพื่อถนอมอาหารเนื่องจากว่าเรามีงานวิจัยร่วมกับมหาลัยเชียงใหม่เกี่ยวกับการาจะเริ่มทำมาหากับการถนอมอาหารประเทศไทยจะได้ขายผลไม้ที่เก็บสุกงอมนะคะมันสามารถรักษาอาหารนะคะเวลาขนย้ายไปต่างประเทศได้อีก28วันเราพยายามจะทำเวลาทำให้ให้ยาวขึ้นเพื่อถนอมอาหารของโลกใบนี้ค่ะนะคะไม่ให้สูญเสียมากไปกว่านี้ค่ะ Thank you One critical question I think both of you to both of you Uh, one part, a participant is asking, pulling away the straw is causing loss of nutrients to uh, in the field. How do you find how? What is the way, I suppose, out of this? Do you think you, by taking away the straw from the field, you are removing also nutrients? Is the argument or is the question? Correct. What do you think about it? Oh, thank you for your question. This is the case of the farmers who are doing agriculture in our farms. The time they are harvesting, they are not able to. ในส่วนของฟางข้าวเวลาเขาเก็บเกี่ยวมันจะยังมีเหลือตอซังอยู่อะค่ะในส่วนของตอซังอันนี้ก็ยังเป็นสารอาหารที่เขาใช้วิธีการถ่ายกลบในพื้นที่แต่ในส่วนของตัวฟางข้าวที่ลำต้นสูงสูงอันนี้คือด้วยในพื้นที่เองคือเขากําจัดด้วยวิธีการเผาอยู่แล้วเพราะฉะนั้นเราไม่ได้ไปรบกวนในส่วนของสารอาหารที่มันควรจะอยู่ในในในพื้นดินในท้องนาค่ะ So you leave enough on the field to to work as uh, uh, nutrients back into the soil. Uh, I am I am thinking I can I'm trying to wrap my head around what Andres has said: distributed ownership, distributed design. What is? Uh, uh, can you tell us? Uh, what is the? How, how do you think? We can combine your ideas, the, what you are suggesting, which seems quite local but also distributed, with the way we uh, we are producing right now. How is it? They are they going to converge? Because we need, we cannot always have a unique product, you based on a unique pro, pro, you know design. We need. Hundreds of thousands of bottles like that. How do you bring that kind of need that we have for mass production of, of most of the products that we use now with the ideas that you are putting on the table for us to think? Yes. You say the future is different. Tell, give us a glimpse of what you see of that free future. Of course, I, I understand. Um, Um, some years ago, it was uh, over the table, the discussion about the relevance of cooperative models and uh, how the business model related with the cooperative world um, can be useful for, I mean, to develop countries, communities, and so on. And I think now we have more tools to uh, improve that model. I think it's, this is not going to, I mean, transform Uh, all the industry. Of course, we need the massive scale, uh, let's say, uh, platform. But the way that the industry need to be related with the community is totally different, I, in, my, in my opinion. So um, we're, we're proving a concept that I didn't show that, but uh, that we're providing a, a kind of a public space for a specific community in Chile. In order to uh, to have a kind of public tool to make things into this community, related with different uh, controversies that they already have. So, on some uh, level, 
uh, you can you can have um, different access of different solutions, but of course that you need to to cover the massive scale with the industry. The question is. Uh, if we want a centralized um, industry or a distributed industry. And um, for now, uh, there is some research that um, um, I think it's very interesting is that related with the cities. I mean, how cities can, again, uh, recover a kind of um, a production uh, platform, e every city. I mean, if we start thinking a city as an island, we need to, uh, you know, uh, make the whole circle process of production and, and tr transformation of the waste and everything as an island. So we can share through cities the information to make things in different places, but we need to understand that there's a lot of things that we can make here. Yesterday, I heard a concept very interesting, which is totally related with this. It was the urban mining. Uh, we have a lot of things that are, are uh, inside of cities to produce things. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can start sharing the information to design things, but we need to be um, very conscious about the context that we're, uh, you know, it surrounded us. So. Um, I think it's not going to, uh, this, this, these ideas are not going to transform the whole industry uh, in terms of massive, uh, you know, production. But I think we need to create a balance because things are changing. And, and most of the people uh, in the industry sector, they don't want to change. They want to continue doing the same thing. So uh, that's, that's uh, I think, my impression. Thank you, Andres. Very, very interesting. I think we all have to kind of start thinking uh, and, and looking. It's, it's creative, it opens up your mind, and, and it's what's happening. There are networks uh, of everything now. Uh, extension workers, networks help, I think, the agriculture uh, sector, the farmers, to use chemical leasing. They, they, that's the critical interface between the chemical supplier and the farmer, as far as I could understand. Now, there is one question which I would like to ask each and every one of you, but with, please respond in one minute, if you can. What uh, challenge, what the topmost challenge that you had to overcome? What was that? And how did you overcome that? So we start from the middle. Uh, Jurawan, what was your most... We, we go one, from the middle to the, to the sides. What was your... Okay. Please, Tom. Uh, for us, it's a problem that we have to deal with. One of the two things. Today, we have to deal with the clean tech. We have to deal with the clean tech. It's good that we have to deal with the clean tech. ให้ให้ความแข็งแกร่งกับระบบพอสมควรจากเดิมเนี่ยโดยขบวนการทั้งหมดเนี่ยมันเป็นศูนย์หน่วยหน่วยงานหลายหลายหน่วยงานเป็นศูนย์แต่วันนี้สิ่งหนึ่งที่เราตอบรับกลับมาเรามีกลายเป็นว่าวันนี้เราเราแตะเท้าไปที่ไหนที่มีคินเทคบล็อกอยู่ข้างหลังเนี่ยเราได้การตอบรับที่ดีมาจากก่อนที่เราท้อเหมือนกันเราเจออุปสรรคตลอดเวลาเหมือนกับเราคุยกับเขาไม่รู้เรื่องหรือหรือเราสื่อสารไม่เข้าใจแต่วันนี้ทุกหน่วยงานของรัฐที่เราเข้าไปสัมผัสก็ได้การตอบรับแล้ววันนี้เราไม่ถือเป็นอุปสรรคกระทรวงพาณิชย์ของเราเนี่ยก็เป็นเหมือนเป็นพ่อค้าให้เรากรมค้าภายในก็เป็นคนที่รวบรวมเกษตรกรพร้อมจะจัดอบรมให้เราลงไปสื่อสารนะคะสวทชนะคะกระทรวงวิทยพยายามจะดันงบประมาณให้เราไปทําวิจัยเพิ่มขึ้นทํามาร์เก็ตติ้งเพิ่มขึ้นนะวันที่ถามเราวันนี้ส่วนต้อมคาสวะเองอ่ะไม่ได้กลัวอุปสรรคค่ะเราพร้อมที่จะเดินไปด้วยกันขอบคุณค่ะท็อปมอสต์ชัลเลนจ์ที่คุณต้องแก้ไขและคุณทำอย่างไรคุณทำก็คือสำหรับเราในฐานะที่เป็นคนทำผลิตภัณฑ์เกี่ยวกับนวัตกรรมค่ะที่ผ่านมาอุปสรรคที่เราเจอที่ผ่านมาเราอาจจะไม่ได้มองว่ามันคือปัญหาแต่ที่ผ่านมาเรามองว่ามันคือสิ่งที่ท้าทายสำหรับเราไม่ว่าจะเป็นในเรื่องของเงินทุนในเรื่องของการพัฒนาผลิตภัณฑ์นะคะมันคือเรื่องที่ท้าทายที่เรามองว่า
คือพอเรามองถึงจุดนี้หรือว่าแม้กระทั่งตัวผลิตภัณฑ์เองด้วยบางทีเป็นวัสดุที่ใหม่เป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ที่ใหม่บางทีมันก็มีผลต่อทัศนคติของของของแต่ละคนว่าเอ้ยบางทีใหม่เกินไม่กล้าจะใช้เพราะฉะนั้นมันเป็นสิ่งที่ท้าทายสําหรับเราว่าแล้วเราจะพิสูจน์ให้เขารู้ได้ยังไงว่าสิ่งนี้มันดีจริงๆค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ So you had to you had some technical challenges maybe technological one could say you had some marketing related challenges which you had to overcome so the, did the program help you overcome these the clean tech program คิดว่าเราจะเอาชนะปัญหานี้ได้จากแต่ก่อนคือด้วยเราเริ่มจากการเป็นสตาร์ทอัพอะค่ะปัญหาของเราตอนแรกที่เราเจอเลยคือด้วยกําลังการผลิตของเราน้อยแต่ตลาดที่เราเจอในช่วงแรกเป็นตลาดที่ใหญ่เพราะฉะนั้นมันทําให้แกลบระหว่างเรากับลูกค้ามันกว้างจึงเป็นสิ่งที่ทําให้เราต้องกลับมาคิดว่าเราจะทํายังไงให้กําลังการผลิตของเรามันเพียงพอต่อความต้องการของลูกค้าค่ะแล้วก็ในการเข้าร่วมคลีนเทคทำให้เราได้เน็ตเวิร์กทำให้เราได้เครือข่ายแล้วก็ทำถ้าพูดตามตรงคือมันทำให้ความน่าเชื่อถือของธุรกิจของเรามันมีมากขึ้นนะคะค่ะซึ่งถือว่าเป็นเป็นการเบิกทางในการทำตลาดให้เราได้อย่างหนึ่งค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ Excellent Thank you So Sena What was the topmost challenge you had to overcome and how did you overcome it Just very quickly please yeah. The the biggest challenge we had was to was the awareness at all levels, the policymakers level, then the farmers level, the suppliers level. So we had to talk to more than 20 farmers and also to the to the agriculture the distributor p e s t i c i d distributors association, um, the policymakers. But nobody could be uh, aware, and most of the time the farmers were skeptical. What about the the loss of production? Or how will you compensate for that? In fact, we had to even talk to insurance company and get an insurance cover to meet this challenge. So, the, and uh, later, of course, they realized that it is uh, the benefit. Thank you. So, so just to collect from the middle of the group, you had uh, you had the production-related challenges, you had the marketing-related awareness raising. And networks. So, but you had, you were able to access a support system that was surrounding you, right? You were able to go to a government agency. You were, you were able to easily access the distributors. There was a working market of distributors of chemicals. Am I right? So, so there were systems. There was a business environment. There was some government support. There was even some international support and recognition networks. So these had to be in your environment for you you to move ahead with the idea, bring it into, and in, bring it to an innovation, and then move forward. So what was your challenge, Andres? Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, it's very hard because we have too many. <laughs> But uh, when when you are thinking in a different way, uh, it's to deal with the conservative world uh, that are, at least in Chile is very strong, and uh, especially when you are putting ideas that are related with um, design, let's say, or information. In a country where uh, everything is related with miners uh, and miners sector or the industry that is totally related with the raw material, so when you are thinking in that way, uh, the friction uh, is that you are generating it's all the time kind of demanding. So um, today uh, our business model is based on uh, 50% percent of our income are coming from public uh, from the public source let's say and the rest are um, you know private projects consultancy and, and, and all the things but it's hard okay so that's also very core thank you for mentioning that 50% percent funding from public sources global clean tech is funded by f public sources. Chemical leasing, this new business model was also supported by public sources, but it seems to uh, take root in the commercial world as well. So, as the last uh, 
Speaker Reinhardt, what is the topmost challenge when you look at the whole innovation space, in your opinion, and what is the topmost uh, uh, solution to that challenge? Thank you. Yep. I'm transferring my job to you. Thanks a lot, Nilgin. Um, I think I take one point up that was mentioned earlier. And, and you indicated it, and I think it has to do something with all the cases. And it's a challenge where we all do not yet have a final solution. And that's about intellectual property rights, uh, confidentiality behind innovation. Uh, so all in all these fields, we are talking about better solutions, better, more efficient solutions, greener solutions. but. Uh, there are restrictions to disseminate. If I, as a company, have such an innovative, good solution, I try to make an advantage on the market and not necessarily I share. And this is really a challenge. Uh, and, and we were talking about chemical leasing, having some hundreds of case studies, but we know there are many more applications, but people don't talk about it because they feel, we have it, why should we share it? And how can you share innovation? And I think that's something where we are all looking for future solutions, how to solve this challenge. And maybe that's something also for the coffee break where we can discuss how international collaboration can help to overcome this problem. It's not something we have already solved. The positive side where you say, what is a major challenge where we found solutions, I would say, is um, to change thinking of people by motivating them for new ideas. So in our case of the chemical leasing, the biggest challenge was to change the thinking of salespeople. Salespeople think, the more I sell, the better. They are trained from the first day of their education to do so. The more I sell, the better. And what was the challenge? To change this thinking, and it worked out by giving case studies, by showing them if you sell less amount, if you focus on the benefit, then you even do better from an economic perspective. And I think this is something similar to have it a bit broader. If you change the mind of people, um, if you go beyond the old roots, then there is an open path uh, to success and to contributions to green industry. Yes, maybe open, open, open communications, open spaces, open discussion, open uh, thinking. Now I don't know. Uh, let's let's talk about this at, during coffee break. We have finished our time. We just have take uh, one minute to do the poll. If you can look at. The, your, the poll questions. The first question is, what is the most important, what is most important, it should read, for further dissemination of chemical leasing? Please uh, choose one of the options and let's see what the audience thinks about this. What, in your opinion, is most important? Policy support, Awareness raising for suppliers, awareness raising for users of chemicals, research and development. What do you think? So, majority thinks, come on, we need more votes. Please, please vote. Majority thinks policy support. Research and development. More? Please. So very few people think chemical suppliers, oh, okay, see, <laughs> by talking we can <laughs> change the, okay, so basically awareness raising of users, the market pool, uh, policy support from the government, they seem rather uh, equal. Let's go to the next question. 
The next question is more generic. What is most important for green innovation? Favorable business environment, intellectual property protection, green finance, education system, encouraging creativity, networks. What is your choice? Choose one, please. You have to say send after you. Favorable <coughs> business environment. No money? Networks? Okay, intellectual property protection is going to go out of the... You've been effective, Andres. It's going to go out of the window soon. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to you all, uh, the audience, contributing with your questions. Thank you all the speakers uh, from very near and quite far <laughs> and somewhere in between. Thanks for uh, the sh telling, sharing with us your experiences in business, product, and process innovations. Let's give them a big applause. So thank you, Nilgun and the panel. Uh, we're now breaking for coffee, after which the, we will be breaking into uh, the parallel sessions. It's the same rooms as yesterday. In this room, we will be having the green investments along the Belt and Road Initiative. And downstairs, uh, one on Ecotowns and Sustainable Cities, and the other one, Monitoring Green Development in Meeting Room F and H. Uh, and I just want to uh, announce, as you might have seen in the program, during the lunch there will be a side event organized by the Glo Global Green Growth Institute on greening industry through green growth programs, uh, which will highlight the importance of green industries in achieving green growth. And it will also introduce the uh, refreshed green industry platform, which have been migrated to the green growth knowledge platform. So. The Green Gro Global Gro Green Growth Institute is, is inviting all of you, or as many as possible, to the uh, that side event will be held in the public foyer. So as you come down the stairs, there will be some people showing you more to the right. So if you're interested in that, please move along that and to the right. But that's for the lunch. So now, the breakout sessions after the coffee. Please enjoy the coffee. Thank you.
On a le gars Eh Ah tiens, tu vois, c'est toi qui... Eh Eh, on a ta barre Je suis allé à la maison, je suis allé à la You need to sell them with a, a solution. Uh, and, and, and then the, the big suppliers like Dow Chemicals decided we will not give some chemicals just to, to, to users. We will not sell any kilogram of the solvent. We will just sell the benefit. And we will take care, this was coming now from a protection aspect, that they are treating these chemicals in the right way. So we will not give them the chemical, like uh, here you have a kilo of this chemical, you can do what you want. It's not longer possible. We give you the solution, and, and the solution is you want to have a clean surface. And we help you, we see your machine, we see your people, we see your people need training, you do it better. And we are providing all this, and at the end of the day, you get what you want at the surface. Or you get what you want, purified water, at the end. And we take care. So this shift from starts to overcome these intellectual property problems. And I'm very glad that China decided <laughs> that they want to start with this. Uh, decided, but you have to overcome a lot of problems. I don't check one, too. You know, when I'm here, there's like no problem, but when I <laughs> left for a coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the director general of UNIDO is Chinese. Yes. And this yes. helps. And this helps. frozen, let's say, the sun, and then we are making this final shape. So eventually you can make bricks uh, with this machine, uh, I don't know, in, in isolated use, uh, places. Use mortar or use mortar or only sand? It is just sand, yes, just sand. To, to make chairs? No, well, I mean, we're not using it. 
Ah, okay, but the thing is, it's, no, we're not using Go. It's, it's just a kind of specific uh, kind of resins. You can share out of sand, right? You show this picture that yeah, yeah, yeah. you have this little pump and... Uh, yeah, it's a kind of pumping, but it's, it's, yes. yes. And so you can share uh, without adding any analysis, only sand. No, it has a kind of a sort of resin. Okay. Which you can try yeah. to say. Yeah, exactly. You need a pump. Yeah, exactly. Just say uh, <laughs> but, yes. but there's another so technique. You have chemical. Yes. Between sand. You can use uh, uh, I mean, Some liquid. uh, liquids that are, uh, oh, I forget the word, that are totally uh, oh, green. Yeah. You need a binder. Yeah, you need yeah, a binder exactly. to bring sand exactly. together. Actually, there is there's a liquid that uh, the military has in the bank, which is totally green, uh, to uh, in Afghanistan, the building. So they were, they were, you know, uh, but they were putting the, uh, 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 yes, on the top, a liquid called polypainment. So the polypainment is very, it's totally green, and it's totally, it's, it's it comes with the uh, design. Soft surface. Uh, yes, exactly. So it's a kind of problem, but I'm very green. I'm worried, my problem, yes, I'm worried about that. But the, the comfort right now for us is basically the time that I mean, to, 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 to okay. 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 because of fry. Fry. No, it's an, inject, an, 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 an injection process. We're pumping, but very small because we're using a kind of uh, nozzle. So we're, we're, this, we're Fabricating something without seeing. Uh, it's, it's under the sea. Uh, 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 yeah. I know it's really cringy. Don't jump ahead in the pool. Yeah. Either you pump it shaking, yeah. it's shaped, or you have a dry process or a wet process. No, but the thing is that we have we have a pumping system here, and then we are we're getting down to the sand with this nozzle, and then we're just pumping a bit inside, and then the machine is moving. Making a, it's a totally different print 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 process because it's not horizontal, it's vertical. So, yeah. But it's an interesting. Do you want coffee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coffee. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
about to start. <laughs> yeah, but I'm looking for. Thank you. Presentation <coughs> first, or yes. uh, no, I, I, oh, are we doing it last? But I think it's fine. It's like oh, okay, okay. So I will move because it's a wider. So, uh, no, I think you should sit one? somewhere here. Yeah, this is this for moderator, and this is the project for you. start by ourselves or somebody is going to introduce the session first? Mm, I think uh, just uh, yeah, we self-organize. Yeah, okay. moderator will. <laughs> okay. So. so, but I'm still looking for Miss Brooks more. Yeah. So, but anyway, I think, I think you can. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sorry? Oh, not different, sorry, sir, because uh, normally we have eight. So I just keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, I think you're sitting yeah. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoy your uh, networking break with coffee, tea, and orange in our last session, mentioned triple win. <laughs> and uh, I know during the coffee break, you talk with your old friends, make a new friends, talk with your neighbors. That's exactly what China is doing now. China's Belt and Road Initiative likes a networking system. China is trying to uh, network with its neighbors, talk about uh, the business, uh, talk about uh, the fun things. Can we have a pass shortcut from my, my garden to your garden? Can we have better uh, coordination in our own you know, public business in the community? This is China is doing. So far, the Belt and Road Initiative has reached uh, over a couple of a billion population, a couple of trillion uh, GDP, and more important, the infrastructure is more or less, somebody estimate is a trillion dollar business. The question is, how can we ensure when we have the uh, infrastructure between the China and its neighbors to have a, a less environmental in impacts to be green. So that's why today we have the session to talk, to talk about uh, the green investment along, uh, green infrastructure investment along the Belt and Road. Today we are honored to have five distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Professor Wang Jingnan is an uh, academician of Chinese Academy of Engineering, and, and he's also the president of the Chinese Academy for Environmental Planning. And he is going to give us an overall picture of China's uh, green uh, infrastructure investment. And we have the Professor uh, Zhang Sufeng, uh, from North China Power uh, University. And he, she is also uh, directs the Institute for Low Carbon and uh, Trade. And she is going to tell us the green power investment along the Belt and Road. You know, as a professor, he has a couple of academic questions in her mind as well. Uh, she needs also your help, the audience. You can provide, you probably can help her, you know, to answer her academic questions as well. <clears throat> we also have uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Li Haifeng from uh, Beijing uh, Enterprises uh, Water Group. He's uh, vice president of the group and dealing with a lot of water purification and uh, wastewater treatment business along the Belt and Road. <coughs> These three are from the host, uh, from, the, from China. I mentioned the network party organizer. <laughs> and we also have uh, uh, Madam Laxmon from the host country, the Belt and Road Investment host country. Uh, she is uh, a Deputy Director General of the uh, East Economic Corridor, which is uh, a Thailand-initiated economic development program. How this EEC can be uh, coordinated with the BRI, that's his, she is going to tell us more about that. And uh, the last one is uh, a Miss... Uh, in Hei Chung from the Global Green Growth Institute. This is the third party as an international organization, how they look at the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and how the green growth can be uh, interact with the uh, green Belt and Road. So that's our, today our five panelists, they're going to talk about the uh, green investment, green infrastructure investment al 
along, uh, along the Belt and Road from the China's perspective, from the uh, Thailand perspective, from international organizations' perspective. I also found our panel is uh, really, including myself, is a perfect uh, agenda balanced. <laughs> so let's uh, start from Professor Wang Jingnan. Uh, he's going to give us an overview of the China's green uh, investment along the Belt and Road. Professor Wang, please. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. So I'm from Chinese Academy of Environmental Planning. So this is an international think tank for the environment decision making for Chinese government. So the major mission of our academy is to help the government to study, to establish some national environment planning, national environment policy, and also national environment project. So today, so I'd like to introduce some background of green infrastructure investment among the BRI. So you know, so <clears throat> Chinese government launched the, the BRI in uh, 2013. Yeah, so, and uh, <clears throat> in this uh, BRI, so Chinese government paid attention, uh, much attention to the environment protection uh, along the BI countries, so, so this uh, program, this initiative, so cover um, most uh, most infrastructures, particularly some um, related to the industrial transportation and so on. Yes, yeah, so. so in the 2017, the Chinese, the China has. Uh, so China uh, compared new contract among the, the contract uh, is about uh, two hundred sixty-five billion US dollar. So among this, so about um, over fifteen percent is uh, is allocated allocated in the. BRI countries. So as you know, so when we launch this program, so we are facing a lot of challenges, particularly environment protection. So in the BRI program, so we are facing two challenges. One is that you know, so most projects are related to the infrastructure and related to some um, some industries such as coal uh, power station and also some basic uh, uh, material uh, of industrial. So, so <clears throat> in this case, so which uh, standard, which environment standard we should follow? So that, that's a challenge. So, because you know, so around the, the BI countries, some are developing countries, some are de developed countries. So this. Uh, Environment uh, standard is is very and and, uh, and changing. The second uh, issue, second ch ch challenge we are facing, is the fragile environment, ecological environment situation. You know, so in some uh, West uh, Asia and uh, countries, so the ecological of environment is uh, fragile and sensitive. So in this case we should pay much attention, we should be careful to follow some environment standard and uh, environment regulation. So, but now so we, have, uh, we have got uh, some good examples in this field. For example, so we listened to so, um, So in, in the 2015, so uh, we, we established a new coal-fired uh, power generation in Pakistan. So, so uh, this project has been finished this, uh, last year. So, so this is the biggest uh, uh, coal power station 
we established in Pakistan. So this project is the, is the first large scale and coal power station with a high efficiency, uh, with a high <coughs> emission standard. <coughs> so that means so this standard is, is the Chinese national uh, emission standard for coal power station. So we have a, a strict, most strict st uh, emission standard in the world for, power, for coal power station. So, you know, so <coughs> we have uh, indicate that is the, the crime per kilo, kilo hour, uh, so that means so, uh, SO4, SO2. So, so this indicate uh, is the lowest uh, in the world. So we, we have reached for this uh, coal power stations. So from this uh, um, piloting um, power uh, station programs, we have uh, learned some uh, experience from this project. So the first one, I think so we should uh, establish a, a good relations between the government, the local government, enterprises, and the local, yeah. And also, <coughs> we have a special uh, uh, Environment, special, environment monitor system, and also uh, we followed the, uh, the international and outstanding uh, emission standard, and also we protect the local ecological environment. So for this uh, field of uh, green investing in the BI, BI countries, so we, have, uh, uh, we have some ideas, so that means so we should uh, uh, pay much uh, attention to the green, uh, green principle in the, in the cycle of a project, uh, project. For example, so before the, uh, investing or uh, construction, we should, uh, take, uh, we should pay much attention to the uh, local standard and the Chinese standard and so on. For during the construction, we should uh, uh, set up a strong relationship between companies and the local, PP, local people. And uh, also, we should set up a, a good relationship between company and uh, NGO and so on. So, so this is the uh, basic information I'd like to Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang. I know you have the time pressure, so, but uh, still, I really want to ask you a question about uh, the coal-fired power plants in Pakistan earlier you mentioned. You said it's uh, adopted the Chinese environment standard is the most uh, cleanest uh, coal-fired fire plants in Pakistan. But uh, still, many people uh, talking about uh, it's still the coal-fired power plants. It's not a pure, renewable, uh, lowest carbon power plants. What do you think about it? Should, in the future, China should invest more renewable, 100% zero carbon emission coal power plants, or still, China should up, uh, invest some uh, clean coal fire power plants? So, let, let us choose. So in China, so you know, so the coal consumption accounts about uh, 15% of the total energy consumption, you know. So. But in Pakistan, I think so. Pakistan can use, make some use of coal. Yeah. And you know, so in uh, uh, today, I think the cost for coal power, uh, coal power station and uh, renewable, such as wind uh, station, so the cost is, is different. So, so I think so the coal power station, the cost is an advantage. I think so in this case, so we can go uh, to, to establish uh, both uh, coal power station and also renewable energy, uh, renewable energy uh, station. So. Mm -hmm. so that means that's a balance between the economic development and the environment. uh, environmental yes. issue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now, it's your turn, Professor Zhang. 
I know you are doing a lot of research work on green power investment. Now you can even later echo the question I raised to Professor Wang as well. <laughs> Please. Uh, actually, I will mention uh, a little bit of uh, things that are related to your question. Um, it's my great honor to attend this conference. It actually is my first time to attend a conference held by uh, international uh, UN uh, organization. So really great honor. Uh, my research field is uh, low carbon economy, which I think it's uh, similar to the uh, circular economy. Uh, my focus is our uh, renewable energy industry in China, like uh, the wind power and the solar power uh, industry. Today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, a project we, we are going to do related to our Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I will talk about uh, uh, the ev why we need to build an evaluation system of green power investment. Uh, first of all, uh, green development is a key idea of the Belt and the Road uh, Initiative. Chinese government, uh, the main policy makers like uh, the NDRC, the National Development and the Reform uh, Commission, and also the Ministry of Environment, have issued a lot of documents strengthening the significance of green Belt and the Road, or the ecological uh, belt and road. Um, I think there are at least two reasons for this. One is that we want to contribute to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, according to uh, a study by uh, Chinese Academy of Science, carbon emissions in the 38 belt and road countries are much higher than the average, the world average uh, level. And the power and the heating sector contribute 25% of the carbon emission. So this is one reason. The other reason is that uh, probably it's a, a good chance, for, a good time, good time for China to establish its green leadership. Uh, yeah, like Wanto said, a lot of uh, questions, a lot of concerns about China's Bell on the Road initiative. Like somebody say, uh, China is grabbing the resources uh, in the Belt and the Road countries, and China is moving the backward industries into these countries. So, uh, uh, green development is very important for the Belt and the Road Initiative. Uh, and green power investment is crucial for green development because, uh, at least uh, currently, the power installation at the, in these countries are very low. It's only three, uh, zero point watt per capita. And the power consumption, consumption is less than 1,500, much lower than the world average. But uh, along with the economic development, along with the urbanization, the uh, power demand will be growing rapidly. And so, power, uh, green power investment will be growing. So, uh, 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 a report says that during 2016 to 2030, power investment will amount to uh, 6.1 trillion US dollars, amount, uh, accounting for 31% uh, of the world total in these uh, Bell and Road uh, countries. But at this moment, uh, the green power investment research is extremely uh, lacking. Uh, since over the past five years, a lot of literature, a lot of Chinese academics have been doing research on these Belt and Road uh, uh, workers. But most of them are concentrated on like, the economic and social conditions of uh, Belt and Road countries and uh, green financing and investment risks in these countries, and few studies about the power investment. 
like a colleague of my, of my one of my colleagues, he do a project on the power sector uh, in the Belt and Road uh, countries, and he proposed that uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative, China should help these countries to improve energy efficiency. Another uh, suggestion is to make investment in renewable energy uh, projects. Uh, but I, we think that the in-depth of uh, researches on the green uh, power investment are lacking. Uh, so we need to do this, we want to do this uh, project. Uh, what we are going to look at uh, include why is how to build green power investment evaluation system. So we need to uh, have to conduct in-depth research rather than uh, general ideas. Uh, so we need to uh, put uh, the ideas into actions. So why is to, uh, to think about the evaluation index system? So uh, we think we need to uh, innovate the concept of green power investment. We should have a broad concept of green investment, power investment. It's not only about uh, renewable energy. It's also about uh, um, sustainability, environmentally and socially uh, sustainable. The second thing is uh, we need to think about the principles of building green power investment evaluation system. The third thing is about the index system for different scenarios. I think we have more than 60 countries along the uh, Belt and Road countries. So we need to have different, uh, we need to consider, take into account the different scenarios, including the country difference, uh, and also the power projects difference, and also the uh, phases difference. For example, we need to think about uh, pre-construction uh, and under construction and after construction. So when we do this evaluation uh, system, we need to uh, think about all this, all this. All, all, and also we need to think about the, the end users. Uh, so this is one thing we, we are trying to look at. The other thing is to look at uh, the situation of China's green power investment. We want to uh, look at some examples, cases, studies to this. And finally, uh, we, need, we want to make, uh, to make suggestions for how to promote uh, green power investment. So uh, we hope our research outcomes will, uh, can help government agencies to make their policies. For example, maybe they can uh, have the blacklist uh, for companies which had bad performance and uh, give financial awards to the companies which have good performance. And also can help power companies to make a green investment. So when the, uh, we have the criteria there, and when the companies make the uh, decision, they need to think about the criteria. And, last, uh, and the third one is to help financial institutions to evaluate power investment projects. Actually, uh, many Chinese uh, financial uh, agencies and also the international uh, financial agencies, they have a lot of valuation system. But we don't think, after literature review, we think there is a, a few uh, evaluation system for specifically for power uh, projects. So, uh, to sum up, green development is the core idea of BRR, green power investment is crucial element of the idea, and innovative evaluation system of green power investment uh, is needed. So this is the approach, one of the approaches to taking ideas uh, to action. Uh, this is a preliminary thinking of our project. So I come here, one of the, as Justin Wanto said, one of my uh, main uh, purpose is to get more suggestions from you uh, experts for how to build this kind of evaluation system. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Zhang. So good luck for your research work, especially the evaluation system. A quick question to you, related to the early question. So when uh, China's investment in Pakistan, so earlier we mentioned the coal fire power plants, suppose one project is on a renewable energy on solar panel. So based on your evaluation system, so when we evaluate the environment, you know, uh, impacts, if from the uh, consumer user's perspective, applying the po solar panel definitely is generate 100% uh, renewable energy, zero uh, carbon emissions. However, from the life cycle perspective, maybe the solar panel is being made in China, in Baoding, uh, not far from Beijing, Making the solar panel, it consumes a lot of energy, right? It's resulting in some dust that might contribute to the Beijing's air pollution, right? So how can you integrate such a life cycle analysis into your evaluation system? How green is green? <laughs> yeah, very good question. Actually, we have just pub published a paper on this life cycle assessment of solar PV. Uh, in China on the trend of cleaner production. Uh, we, I and my students look at uh, from the mining of the ore and then the module, uh, this building and module and also, and then recycle of the, uh, the, the system. Mm -hmm. And also we think about the export uh, uh, factors. So uh, the, I mean, the, the result, uh, yeah, really, we, uh, for China, for the manufacture of the solar PV, uh, we have the environmental uh, impacts for China. Yeah, so uh, you have a great, the, your question is how to balance the, the, the use Actually, of... Actually, uh, I mean, from the life cycle perspective, how uh, can you evaluate the system? Uh, evaluate. Uh, looks like... Uh, is zero carbon emission. Actually, if from life cycle perspective, is not, right? Yeah, 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 very good question. But uh, yeah, I will consider your, <laughs> this uh, view into our evaluation system. Actually, I haven't done anything about this system, just a, a preliminary thinking, okay? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Zhang. And after power, now let's move to water. How? Well, we, we can have a, a water treatment investment to be green, yeah. Please, Mr. Lee. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I'm Francis Lee, uh, good morning. As the professor and the officer, they're talking about BRI from a macro level. So I'm from a macro, from a company opinion. Uh, BWG, we are Beijing Enterprises Water Group, as we short call BWG, we are leased in Hong Kong capital market, but actually our business more than 90% in mainland of China. And then we developed a lot of investment in Bell Road uh, since 2009. Uh, according to our uh, uh, will, there will be uh, for the environmental business on the uh, Belt Road, maybe nearly 6% uh, is on the wa water investment. Uh, the other will be soil and uh, solid uh, treatment. For water, there are a lot of form of the investment. Uh, water supply with the treatment, seawater desalination and something. So it's similar in China. So. Uh, our group, there is a cover a lot of sector, including the beer, uh, r uh, toll road, and uh, for the gas, and the other real property, and then, so for Beijing Enterprises Water Group, we are the uh, uh, water treatment platform in the group. Uh, now, actually, we are, uh, our benefits owner is Beijing Municipality, so we are SOE, but it's not, they are not controlling, they are majority, uh, larger majority shareholder. So we are first SOE for the Bell Road investment since from 2009. And uh, we are the first 
uh, the mixed ownership in the water uh, sector. So that's why last uh, 10 years we grow so fast. Uh, it's growth of 340 times. Uh, 2009, we only 1 million tons uh, uh, capacity treatment, but now we have, we have 34 million tons per day treatment capacity. So we are the largest uh, the, uh, player in China. We are uh, top three globally, uh, smaller than Shui's and smaller than Wiolia. So we are top three in the world. And we are the first uh, uh, company uh, water for the Bell Road, as I mentioned, from 2009. And we have the footprint uh, in some countries later I mentioned. And then we are the first company to develop underground uh, plant. Uh, so underground plant can be uh, cost uh, land saving and uh, environmental friendly. And uh, we are the first SOE company to uh, for the PPP and for the other. So we are uh, the mixed ownership company. So that's why. Uh, develop quickly, so we think about the, the creative the business model along the Bell Road and including mainland China. So you can see it is our footprint, uh, more than 90% in China, including Macau, uh, Taiwan, and the other country, for including Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Australia, and Portugal. And uh, we have over 860 plants including water supply, sewage treatment, and uh, including uh, the river purification and the plant. Uh, in China, we covered more than uh, 200 cities, actually. So uh, uh, we will make more investment in Pakistan, uh, Indonesia, and uh, uh, Sri Lanka, something, so including the Southeast Asia. And for the Bell Road, we have uh, facing the challenge as the professor mentioned. So the first one is geopolitical consider consideration. For the company level, so we, uh, in middle of China, we put the financial return and the prior priority cons consider. But for the Bell Road, actually, we are considered geopolitical. We are considered legal system. And then the third one is a financial return. So for the geopolitics is, um, uh, is, is, is top the issue we should consider. And the second we consider the legal system. And there are different, uh, 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 different uh, environment, different uh, legal system uh, in Asia, Europe, including Middle East. So the third one consider about it the culture, the religions. So uh, last uh, 10 years, our uh, development uh, in the Bell Road is actually full of tear and blood, but we still survive. So, and we are confident the water is very, uh, the biggest issue the human uh, faced. It feel a lot of challenges, sort of what, including Beijing municipality, is the one of top 10, the city is sort of water. They can, cannot believe it. So, and the water is no boundary, like the doctor, no boundary. So that's why we get involved, the Bell Road investment from the water uh, the angle. And yes, so we, I think from the whole China uh, companies, uh, especially in environmental company, we are the first one and we're the largest one and the successful investment in uh, Bell Road. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, very impressed by your uh, BWG uh, portfolio uh, uh, worldwide and uh, along the Bell and Road. You mentioned your tear and blood stories, but I guess we don't have time to talk more about the details about the story. But my quick question to you is whether you have the, any projects in Thailand, especially in East Economic Corridor. Uh, Thailand has uh, 
uh, East Economic Corridor Program, okay. uh, which is uh, more or less trying to coordinate with uh, China's BRI initiative. Do you have any projects in this area, or generally in Thailand? Uh, not yet. Uh, we are interested. You uh, know, uh, the more population, the more water required, and the more business in water sector. Mm -hmm. So Thailand, there are nearly uh, 100 million uh, population, and uh, so uh, that's the, our um, interest. But now, at the current moment, we don't have the project in Thailand, mm -hmm. and. This is uh, related to the, uh, the water policy system. And uh, we are, uh, the Chinese people is very good because they fall uh, 1.4 billion population. The second is Indonesia is 1.3 population, but uh, we uh, make loss in the uh, Indonesia market. <laughs> uh, we, we don't have uh, the project in Indonesia. And the Thailand uh, is good, uh, nearly 100 million. So uh, we're interested in con contact with some uh, company, but they don't have now. OK. Yeah. So thank you. Now, well, I'm curious what uh, East Economic Corridor project, what you are doing now. So now it's your turn, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Lexmom. Thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is an honor for me to be here today and tell you a little bit more about the Eastern Economic Corridor of Thailand, or in short, we call the EEC. Um, the first picture here shows you where EEC is in relation to the Belt and Road development geographically. So if you look at the map, you will see that along the Belt and Road um, development, um, there are several special economic zones. Perhaps we can categorize ourselves as one of the special economic zones, but actually the EEC is beyond economic development zones. It's more than that, which I will tell you about it later. Um, when we look at so many economic zones along the BRI, we know that investment in infrastructure within each economic zone is happening. So lots of infrastructure investment is happening. More than that, when we think where do we locate special economic zones, one important decision making is based on connectivity. So infrastructure connectivity is important part of special economic zones development. So we can be really certain that huge amount of investment in infrastructure along Belt and Road is happening for connectivity. And are these infrastructure green enough? Uh, do they take into consideration um, environmental issues enough? That is something for all of us to, to bear in mind, to discuss and to remind policymakers. So now we zoom into the Eastern Economic Corridor. From the map, you see the last one is the Eastern Economic Corridor, um, which is in the eastern part of Thailand with the connection to the sea. So now we zoom into the Eastern Economic Corridor itself. Um, it includes three provinces in Thailand connecting to Bangkok, where we are at the moment. That's why we call it the corridor, because it links Bangkok to the eastern part of Thailand with gateway to, we say it's a gateway to Asia, because with the transportation route, um, Eastern Economic Corridor can serve as a gateway of BRI to the whole of Asia as well. Looking at the investment in the EEC, or the Eastern Economic Corridor, I would like to draw your attention to two groups of investment. The first group of investment is in infrastructure. Um, so the top box on the left-hand side is investment in infrastructure. When you look at the map, you can see that there are already two international airports in Bangkok at the top of the map. And one new airport is going to be built at the bottom of the map there, 
in the EEC area. Um, the three airports will be connected through high-speed rail. And this is one intention of the Thai government, um, not only to, to increase um, uh, connectivity, but we know that railway connectivity is the way to go for the future. We should reduce carbon emission by road transportation. We should increase a more green mode of transportation. So the airports will be linked by high-speed rail. We have two deep sea ports in the EEC area which will be expanded in the next five years as well. And the seaports will be linked through all the depots by double track railway. Again, so we resort to railway mode of transportation. Apart from that um, main infrastructure in the EEC, we are also looking to um, invest in new smart cities in the EEC area. And of course we know smart cities, one important concept of smart city must be eco-friendly. So that's again, um, that's how the Thai government look at green um, policy um, in the overall picture. And we would like to implement that in the EEC to begin with. Another group of investment um, within the Eastern Economic Corridor area is the investment in targeted industries. Um, the Eastern Economic Corridor development was meant to be the vehicle to implement the Thailand 4.0 initiative. And the Thailand 4.0 initiative is all about higher technology, new technology, and of course, green technology as well. So we say we would like to focus in 10 particular industries for Thailand into the future. And the EEC will be the first area in Thailand to host these new technologies. And if you look at the, the targeted technologies, you will find that bioenergy, green energy, renewable energy is one of the targeted sector that the Thai government is going to promote. The overall development of EEC, I mentioned earlier, that is beyond special economic zones because the, the law governing the development of the EEC in Thai language is actually called Eastern Area Development Law. We're not talking about economic development only. We're not talking about industrial activities only. So the law says that we will host industries in certain areas in these three provinces because we have to make sure that the green areas remain green. Industries should be together within the area with good enough environmental management, good enough facilities to make sure that there is no impact on environment, on health, on social well-being of people in those um, areas. That's why I say it's beyond economic zones. It's more than that. And another intention of the Eastern Economic Corridor development is that we would like to implement an area development concept. As um, earlier speakers mentioned, water has no boundary. Development has no boundary as well. We found that many times because of the administrative boundary of each province, there is no good coordination among provinces, especially on environmental issues. So we would like to see if we have this special area with special power and coordination on water, on environmental issues, on land use zonings does not stop at the boundary of administrative um, boundary should improve the overall green economy of Thailand. So the last slide I would like to show you would be um, this one. Among the infrastructure projects in the EEC, these are the projects that we call for private sector participation. 
meaning that we open these projects for PPP, public-private partnership. Um, we have lots of interest from many countries around the world and of course, lots of interest from Chinese um, participants. So this is another, I would say all these infrastructure projects would be another chance for cooperation among Chinese participants, Thai participants, and international participants to make sure that infrastructure investment in the EEC and along BRI um, take into consideration um, climate uh, perspective. I would like to stop here and maybe we can discuss later. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wonder in the current EEC uh, program, any other projects which is directly, you know, coordinated with uh, China's uh, BRI initiative? As I mentioned, the projects are open for international bidding. The first project that we already um, uh, has the TOR and have expression of interest by international community is the high-speed rail mm -hmm. linking three airports. Mm -hmm. um, we have 31 firms who bought the envelopes. Mm -hmm. And among the 31 firms, eight are Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. So with support from the Chinese government, of course. Mm -hmm. And for other investment projects, we have discussions with many Chinese companies with support from the Chinese government. So the coordination will be through the private sector investment, but of course with support from both governments and other governments as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so regarding the high-speed rail, I should uh, share my yesterday's experiences with you. Yesterday morning, I had a, a breakfast in an eco village in southern China. And after breakfast, I immediately went to the high speed rail station. I took the high speed rail about five hours to Beijing. I'm, I had a meeting uh, in Beijing. And after the meeting, I immediately to the airport and flew to Bangkok airport. So, high speed rail very dramatically changed the lifestyle, the work e efficiency very dramatically. I strongly encourage the EEC should have such a kind of high-speed rail uh, projects. Yeah. And uh, not only in this region, not only we have the BRI, we have the EEC, and also uh, Global Green Growth Institute also has a couple of green growth-related programs. So let's move to Ms. Chung. Uh, she's from uh, GGGI. She's directing the safeguard unit. Uh, as we know, uh, Dr. Pangi Meng uh, was the Secretary General of the United Nations, but now his new job is uh, Chairman of the Board of GGGI. Please, let's see what uh, uh, Mr. Pangi Meng is giving us some new visions. <laughs> Thank you very much, moderator. Um, Good, mor uh, good, good morning, everybody. My name is In Hee Chung. I'm from the Global Green Growth Institute. And before I start, I have to uh, say uh, some apologies because I have to leave, I think, in about 15 minutes just for the side event during lunchtime that will happen in the public foyer. So I'll excuse myself once I give my presentation, I think. Um, well, as, as mentioned by our moderator, yes, Ban Ki Moon is currently the chair of, uh, of GGGI. Uh, he um, took up that post in February 2018 and uh, he's uh, really helping to uh, get the message out in terms of how green growth can really um, meet the challenges of SDGs and, and the NDCs and etc. Our vision and mission are quite similar to be honest with, with that of other international organizations. We are looking, you know, we, we strive for inclusive green uh, and sustainable growth. Um, our target countries are mainly LDCs, least developed countries, as well as uh, economists in transition and emerging economies as well. Um, so what we're looking at is we are really get, getting the, the, the foundation in the economic performance or economic growth that is both environmentally sustainable and um, socially uh, responsible and inclusive. So that's a bit about GGGI. But before I go on to the BRI, I need to sort of give you a context of what we're doing uh, worldwide. So at a glance, um, we have about 28 member countries um, and then 
from, from those member countries and elsewhere, we have about 27 country programs, including China. China is not our member country as of yet, but uh, we have a presence in China, uh, in Beijing. However, we are now in talks of having that um, sort of move to, to our Seoul headquarters, given the strategic importance. Uh, so China is one of our um, uh, very important uh, programs that we are trying to uh, really promote. Um, we're a very small organization. Um, we're a, founded uh, in 2010, but only became an intergovernmental organization in 2012 during the Rio, uh, Rio Plus 20 uh, conference. Um, annual budget about 55 million, um, about, about 300 staff, most of whom are actually in our country program. So we about, have about 100 people at headquarters in, in Seoul and the rest in our uh, 27 plus country programs. Um, we're looking at four specific sectors, sustainable cities, water and sanitation, land, sustainable landscapes and um, energy, obviously. Um, and, and there are some multi-sectoral um, initiatives going on as well. And from all of those sectors, industry is, is a very important component. Just to give you a bit about you know, so how we deliver our services to our partner countries, well, we look at the, uh, the green growth strategies and plans that are very much linked to their development vision, their um, long-term you know, economic uh, development goals, uh, and then we will then zoom in on some of the sub-national or sectoral strategies. Um, and what's, what we've been focusing on these days uh, over the last couple of years is actually on the implementation of those strategies and plans in terms of financing. So we found out that there's a bit of a, a missing middle where there's a lot of, um, uh, well, they say that you know, money is not really an issue. There's a lot of funds out there. It's, it's, it's the availability of good projects to fund. So... In the countries that we operate, you know, there are green growth policies and plans in place. However, there are not that many bankable projects that the financiers are willing to fund. So that's where I think GGGI comes in to, uh, to help structure the projects so to be more bankable. And we're also looking at what, what we call a national financing vehicle, which is a more of a blended financing mechanism for governments to channel both public and private money to implement the green growth strategies and plans. Um, and we're also supporting countries to access those climate and green finance. And this is where China comes into play. Um, with China, you know, with, with the, the, the investment um, for the, the foreign direct investment for, that China is doing in, in Africa, especially, uh, we find that there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration. And that's where we um, are are sort of looking at the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, we're very much earlier on in, in the involvement of BRI, uh, had a few workshops and meetings uh, in different venues. But basically, um, if you look at the countries, especially in Southeast Asia and Africa, that's where we are actually present. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, room for collaboration uh, between the BRI and our GGGI member countries. So what exactly are we looking at? At the moment, it's, it's very much at the more generic and sort of brainstorming level. Uh, we know that China is very keen to share knowledge, experience, tools with other developing countries who are looking to China for their sort of development inspiration. Um, so we're looking at those methods and best practices. We're looking at some of the technology, the solar and the renewable technology that China has been uh, developing uh, to see how we can transfer that technology to, to our developing countries. And obviously investment, uh, the, the Asian Infrastructure uh, Investment, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank obviously is one of our main um, sort of target to see how we can channel that funding to, to fund some of those uh, green growth uh, bankable projects and the Silk Road Fund, etc. So identifying what other methods and best practices are out there, some technologies that we can, uh, we can sort of reap or we can uh, try and target, and then the investment opportunities that China has. And then, as I said, um, there's, there are GGGI member states um, that we have. The country list um, you can see on your right are a few of them. Um, I think Mongolia, Indonesia, Ethiopia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Philippines, India, Sri Lanka, and Thailand even, I think, also has a potential. We have a Thailand program here. So these are some of the things Things that we can actually uh, help to uh, see how we can, you know, bridge some of the gaps between what uh, what our member states are trying to do and, and the financing opportunities and the technology needs through the Chinese BRI. So that's sort of the the overview of um, of where we're trying to go. Uh, as I said, it's very much in the early stages, so we're you know gathering information, forging networks, meeting people, etc. At this point. Some challenges, though, that we've been encountering so far is the gap between the BRI country demand that we are in operation and the China, Chinese supply. I think 
from our very limited experience, um, the projects China seeks to finance is quite large. It's very, it's, it's you know, it's, it's scale, financing to scale. Whereas the projects that we are finding in developing world is is not that large in terms of demand. So that meeting, you know, meeting that sort of um, the gap, uh, we found it a bit of a challenge. Uh, maybe bundling certain projects so that it has that scale could be an option, but uh, this is some of the issues that we've been facing at the moment. I think this was mentioned by a previous speaker, but some, there are many stakeholders uh, to coordinate within one project, um, which means you know, to collaborate with a lot of investors and comply with requirements. And I think language barrier came as one of the issues as well by our water um, speaker, uh, and cultural barrier and high price with middlemen, et cetera. So we find these issues to be uh, quite uh, challenging um, in terms of um, you know, trying to meet some of the demands and the supply of this BRI and GGGI. Um, and I, I'm actually responsible for safeguards, uh, environment social safeguards at GGGI, and uh, we've had a, a chance to also see whether we can support uh, for example, AIIB in their uh, environmental social safeguard mechanism set up, etc. So I know that environmental social safeguard is something that's quite high in the agenda of the Chinese government. Uh, the kind of investment they do in Africa and Southeast Asia, they need to do it in a very environmentally, socially friendly way, in a responsible way. And I think that's where also where Gigi Jai can and support and help. So I think that's, that's my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chung. What I learned from you is uh, GGJ seems a treat as China, not only the financial provider, also the green technology provider and the, even the knowledge provider. So can you specify what kind of green technology, what kind of knowledge you are thinking China, you can leverage China to, to be uh, applied in other Belt and Road countries or your GGGI green program countries? Sure. Um, well, we are not, we're not a financial provider nor a technology provider. We, we consider ourselves more like a broker, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, connecting different dots and, and coordinating. Uh, we do see a lot of value in that, given that a lot of players and stakeholders that are involved in this, in this sphere. Um, China, um, for example, the renewable energy technology, I think, has really been one of the main successes of, Ch of China's story. Um, really you know, bringing up that up to scale and commercializing, I think that's a very very interesting topic to be, to be learned by our member countries. Um, African countries in particular, they're very interested in, in the success story of China as well as Korea. Mm. Uh, and they're very keen to learn what, you know, what is the, the secret ingredient to developing fast and in, in a, of course, environmentally, socially sustainable way. So, um, so I think that's some of the things that they, they're interested in. And another, another aspect is uh, the different mechanisms that, I think China also is quite similar to Korea, as a Korean myself, that there is a very strong linkage between the government policy and R&D. Uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. so, so how does that facilitate you know, um, the uptake of technology or the development of clean technology in a country? I think that they're quite interested in, in getting that mechanism set up as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, Professor Zhang and Professor Wang can tell you more about how China's policy you know, uh, supports the industries to develop their green technology. And these two professors, that's a research topics uh, on the renewable uh, technology policy and on the environmental planning policy. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Lee also knows a lot about uh, the water sector technology uh, uh, supported by the governmental policies. But uh, I know, I actually, I have uh, also a couple of questions to ask you, but I know you have even more major very important job to do to organize a lunch event for us. So we are expecting your another mm -hmm. uh, good performance to show us what the GGGI is doing. Let's uh, thank her, give her a big uh, applause. Yeah. Please come to our lunch event for those who are interested in our GGGI and, and the green industry work. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you wish, actually, you can leave even now. So to do your preparation. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for our uh, panelists and uh, excellent job. Uh, I want to back to the, at the beginning, Professor Wang, uh, in his presentation, 
he mentions the two big challenges for the green infrastructure investment along the Belt and Road. One of them is environmental standards issue. When China's investment in uh, host countries along the Belt and Road, what kind of environmental standards should the Chinese company should follow? Should they follow the Chinese national environmental standards, or should they follow the host country environmental standards? Or if there is an international environmental standards, uh, should China uh, follow? or oh, even no international environmental standards. Maybe the NGOs like WWF, my organization, we create many different standards. Should the Chinese company follow those standards? This is a general question to our panelists. Maybe, uh, Francis, you can go first. You really have yes. the practices, you know, okay, <laughs> yes. facing the questions. Yes. As we know, there are different uh, standards among water design in China and uh, the Southeast Asia. Most of Southeast Asia, they are followed the standard from the UK and European. So this uh, confused our uh, te technical team, but we have to follow the host, uh, the local standard. We, we must do that, such as in Malaysia, they have a span, a span standard requirement. Uh, it's uh, not only the, the design, but also the equipment. Some equipment were efficient and safe, used long history in China, but they're not past the span in the Malaysia. Then we, we cannot use it. So my experience that we can negotiate with the authority in the local country, such as in the water design, I, we insist our standard in some specific, not, not, not overall, the specific, but the government don't uh, agree with us and then we give the bank guarantee to them to trust me, they were very, very experienced. And in this specific, so our change will to meet your standard, don't, don't worry. And then we go provide two and a half year operation guarantee. And then we provide the bank guarantee for the change. They accept the more negotiation, but overall we follow the host standard, not from China, I think. Professor Wang, so you mentioned the, the clinical power plants invested in Pakistan, they follow the Chinese standard. Why is that? Why is it different with the water standards? They follow the Malaysia one. <laughs> so I have some different uh, idea comment to follow uh, emission standard, environment standard. So, so now in China, so you know, so Chinese uh, government has a new policy for clean air, clean water, and uh, clean soil, you know, so. So now, so we have, we are setting up some new environment standard, particularly em emission standard. So we have uh, three type of emission standard. One is national emission standard. So that's the basic, should be followed by each company's. The second standard is that, so how to say, so we, we say, Special limit, uh, special. So this standard is more strict than national standard. So for example, so in Beijing, Tianjin, and the Hebei region, so we follow this special uh, limit standard. The third one is uh, we, we, we may call clean production standards. So that's the best standard. So that is a voluntary standard. So government in college, and plus to follow in some special region such as Beijing, Tianjin region, and Yangtze, and also some other, such as new area, Fengwei area, yes. So personally, I think so, we should encourage the companies which go to the belt, low countries, so to follow a high emission standard. So it's possible, it's possible, I think. You know, so more than 10 years ago, for the cost of SO2FGD technology or so, the cost of per kilowatt was about 10,000 Chinese yuan, 10,000 Chinese. 
But it does the cost, the investment cost is about 200, 300 Chinese yuan. So, so the cost has reduced, reduced rapidly. So, so in this case, so we encourage the empires which go to the belt, the belt load countries and should follow the clean production. Chinese government also <coughs> provided some technical guidelines for the, com for the companies uh, who are involved in the BI, BI uh, infrastructure, cultural project. So, so in these guidelines, we also suggest the company to, to follow a new and more strict environment standards. Yeah, so, so maybe the, the, the world treatment is, is a little different from uh, um, such, a, such as AI pollution related industry and the infrastructure, yes. Thank you, Professor Wang. So, Professor Zhang, based on your research work on the renewable energy policy, if China has a solar or wind or even micro hydro such a project, a green power projects investment in the Southeast Asia countries, should the standards, the manufacturer standards, should follow the local one or should follow the Chinese one? or should follow the European one? Oh, personally, I think I agree with uh, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. Francis. <laughs> Just to respect the host countries, uh, will, if they don't require mm -hmm. the high standard, why should we follow the high standard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my okay. will, yeah. Okay, so. So, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Laxman. You mentioned the, for the EEC, it's the one, one of the major infrastructure is uh, high-speed rail. If in the future in the EEC, the high-speed rail, they are still in the preparation process, could be, you know, the project that could be, you know, by the Chinese company or Japanese company or even German ones. So, do do you follow their own country standards for the high speed rail, or Thailand has its own standards? Um, if we talk about environmental standards, then we have our own environmental standards, which um, investors will have to follow. Mm -hmm. um, but the technology standard, of course, that we have to look into the higher technology where possible. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I'd like to mention is that um, the EEC is now working with the support of UNIDO. Um, we are looking at the international framework on eco-industrial parks and we would like to, to make sure that we do better than what we are doing now. Um, so the UNIDO is helping us to, to benchmark mm -hmm. where the EEC is at at the moment, according to the international framework, and we will set the target, say, within five years, where we would like to reach international benchmark. And uh, we will try to make sure that um, all agencies involved um, have policies and regulations in accordance to our ambition, so that we will reach a higher international standard for eco-industrial parks. So that's good. I think uh, you differentiate the technology standards and uh, environment standards as a different. You, the technology you may respect as the investors, the environment standards by Thailand own, right? And the following question to you. Sometimes, you know, the UNIDO may have its own environment standards for the manufacturers. And uh, like uh, the World Bank has its own safeguard system which is slightly different with UNIDO, with uh, Asia Development Bank. Early, uh, Chung, uh, Ms. Chung, she left, she mentioned AIB safeguard uh, standards. That's also different with the World Bank, with ADB. In this case, you, Thailand government, you want to create its own safeguard and environment standards or follow one of them, or just the 
earlier you mentioned that you need one. At the moment, we have our own environmental safeguard policy in Thailand already. Okay. Mm. Um, when I mentioned the international framework, um, mm. I think the work was done in collaboration between the World Bank, the UNDP, the UNIDO, and many agencies. So it's sort of an agree um, 100 points standards for the world. Mm. Of course, each agency at the moment, their own safeguard policy might not be there yet, but it's sort of an agreement that everybody would like to be there one day in the near future. Um, so for us, we have our own environmental standards in Thailand, but we also look to the best international standards where several international organizations have worked together and uh, we would like to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's a, a standards issue for the investment is a, really a big issue. You know, among the world, there are so many different kind of safeguards, uh, standards, and uh, which somehow for investors create a kind of, you know, investment barriers. You have to follow each country is different, uh, the, each organization project is different. So my dream, so my, my own view, I think in the future, if from the global environment perspective, from a global governance perspective, if we have uniform one standard, that would be much better for all of the country, all of the investors, all of the UN organizations, international financial institutes to follow one. That would be much easier, but that's my dream. I don't know how soon we can achieve or realize my dream. And uh, from the audience, we already got uh, uh, many questions from the audience. Uh, See, one question directed to you, Professor Wang Oh. Do you have any comments on the green industry parks uh, collaborations along the Belt and Road Initiative, Professor Wang? That's a special to you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I think so the green industrial park in this field, the unit of green industrial park, so China has some experience. You know, so I think more than 10 years ago, so China has uh, developed some national green industrial parks, which we call eco-industrial parks. So in China, so we have about 3,000 national and uh, provincial level industrial parks. So among this uh, about 3,000 uh, industrial parks, we have uh, set up about 100 eco-industrial parks. So let me so this uh, 100 uh, eco-industrial parks were planned by the national expert team and also approved by the some department of the central government, such as the former the Ministry of Environment Protection and the Ministry of Science and Technology and the MoveTech and the Ministry of Industry and Information and so on. Yeah. So we also has, uh, have set up some regulation laws, such as so, you know, so more than 10 years ago, we China issued the law of clean production promotion law and also circular economy promotion law. So I think so. These two national law has played a great role in promoting eco industrial park in China. So now so we also set up a, a green BRI uh, cooperation platform among BRI countries. So, so this platform is set up by the Ministry of Ecological and Environment. So on this platform, so we can do a lot of work in the eco-industrial park and also some other issues. And that's my question. 
can you tell us more about uh, the China's uh, uh, eco industrial park in Ethiopia? Uh, it seems the China's uh, the eco industrial park in Ethiopia is very successful so far. So the uh, because of you know the uh, the financial investment from China to Ethiopia and other countries too. You know, Ethiopia is one of the fast economic growing country in Africa. And even the GDP reached seven percent annually in the recent years. Can you share more information about this? So I think so. Uh, Industrial Park is a, is a is a is a successful model in mm. China. You know, so. Mm. so I just give you an example. So mm. in Tianjin, so near near Beijing, so. About 15 percent of valued industrial, um, added in, in value of industrial are from the Tianjin, that is Taida Industrial Park. So, and we have, we have a lot of such a story in other cities, in other provinces. So I think so, because of the productivities of industrial park. It's much high, and also we can absorb a lot of investment from other regions, other countries. So, so that's a successful model. So, I think so. This model can be adopted by some African countries. That's my personal idea. Thank you, yeah. Professor Wang. Actually, he's the president of a Chinese Academy of Environment Planning. Doing the environment planning, doing such a kind of industrial park planning, that's his, you know, he and his team's job. I wonder, do you think is that useful for the EEC in the future if China has more and more investment come to Thailand in the EEC? And uh, could be one possibility could be concentrate on the industry in the industrial park to be ecological. Let Professor Wong to come back to Thailand again to make an environment plan for the EEC. Do you think that kind of uh, cooperation is in the EEC's consideration? I would like to see Pro Professor Wang do more than that. Mm -hmm. The environmental plan for the whole of BRI. Mm -hmm. And because EEC is part of the BRI anyway, so we can cooperate. <laughs> That's great, yeah. <laughs> so on the water issue, also, are there any like uh, industrial park models that concentrate in one place or just uh, separate, distributing many different places? Uh, the industrial park, it seems in the past in China has done is let the more or less such a kind of industry concentrate on together. Do you have any experiences in the, regarding the industrial park in China or other countries, Mr. Li? Yeah, uh, water issue. For example, maybe the industrial park, not only one uh, company, a couple of companies, they're doing the same or similar in industry, same sector, they discharge into a pool, maybe your company, uh, constant, you know, de dealing with the wastewater, you don't have to go to each company individually, go to the industrial park to do the wastewater treatment. Yeah. Yes, according to the experience in China, so uh, the first one, the industrial park, is a good uh, maximum to mm -hmm. cons consolidate all the different company together, mm -hmm. and then to protect the environment pollution, and mm -hmm. then the requirement for the uh, the company in the park, they should to pre treatment before uh, uh, the, uh, to uh, uh, infuse the water into the pool. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is good for the water treatment and improve the efficiency and uh, environment protection. Mm -hmm. But the other hand, all the industry has a life cycle. So uh, for the water company, mm -hmm. they, they are very take a risk for the investment. And then if the cycle is good on the peak, so you have more water treatment, mm -hmm. but if it's going to the lower at the cycle, there will be no water. And then there's no return for the single company. So uh, our uh, experience, it should be government 
get the, uh, the minimum guarantee mm -hmm. to protect this, the, uh, all the uh, park can run very well. Mm -hmm. If it's the no government take the, the minimum guarantee, it's, uh, it, it will be a risk, I think. Mm -hmm. So I just to check the, from the, yeah, go ahead, please. So for the planning, so I have uh, some more comment here. So, so when we go to the uh, BI countries for the investing of infrastructure, so we are facing such an issue. So most countries, particularly in African countries, are lack of master plan for infrastructure construction. So let's use so. So if you have a master plan, maybe for three or five years plan for the infrastructure construction, so maybe the project allocation or design will be more easier and will be more effective. So you know in China, so most local government and the particularly for the municipal governments, they have a five years plan for the infrastructure. So Every five years, so the government will, will assess the, the final and the loads of the five years infrastructure construction planning. So, so that's my suggestion. So when we go to the BI countries, we should encourage this country, particularly African countries, to develop some master plan for infrastructure construction. Thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, I checked uh, from the Slido, trying to find uh, the uh, polling question, but it seems not here. And I wanted to raise uh, a polling question, polling question, and also let you guys to summarize uh, less than one minute your, your main uh, uh, reflections to the audience uh, uh, during our discussion. My question is, is China's BRI promoting green development in the host countries along the Belt and Road? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Professor Zhang? Uh, yeah. As I... Uh, made in my presentation, I think China has the idea, the, this is the core idea of China's Bell on the Road initiative. So we are now doing, what we are need, needed to do is to turn the uh, idea to actions. Mm -hmm. so. Francis. Yeah, definitely positive. So uh, we do the project in Malaysia is the underground, the Panda 2, and the, all the uh, citizens around this area, they all cheer for about our improvement the project. And we do the project in the Singapore new water treatment, mm -hmm. and we run the operation in the Australia and some countries. Mm -hmm. So it's good. I think it's do a lot of uh, uh, support and uh, you're meant to improve. I think we do the good job. Great. You want to add more? Yeah, yeah. I just want to add yes. one thing. Uh, you know, in my university, in all, in many Chinese universities, we are now have a lot of uh, foreign students from the Belt and Road countries. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese government provides a lot of uh, assistance for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so fellowship? Fellowship, yeah. Okay. Fellow, mm. fellow scholarships, mm -hmm. yeah. That's good, yeah. So uh, the Chinese, a lot of complaint from Chinese people. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. uh -huh. But anyway, I mean, this is for the uh, capacity building, for mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. talents, mm -hmm. uh, training, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe it's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's your opinion, Lex uh, Wang? Um, in every discussion that we have with the Chinese government, Chinese agencies, um, we notice that mm. environmental issues, green economies mm. are important themes of all discussions. So we believe that Ch the Chinese government and China is very sincere mm -hmm. in green development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to yes, add one please. word. Yeah, yes, she, the lady just yeah. G -G 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, from GGGI. 
Yeah. Yeah. She mentioned about the how China make a success mm. uh, in a renewable energy. Mm. Actually, we did make success uh, in terms of uh, mm. the installation, but also we have many uh, lessons. Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps this mm. is one aspect we can put in the uh, mm. uh, mean to provide our lessons, our experience to mm. the BRI countries mm -hmm. in renewable energy development. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very important. Not only the lessons can share with uh, bilateral countries, uh, and experiences, both experiences and licenses. Myself, you know, I'm a Chinese, but I live in Washington, D.C. For, for years. What I found, I really learned a lot from U.S., both experiences and licenses. And doing my research work, and I uh, Learn such a kind of U.S. experiences and lessons to China to make a better environment policy. That's I think a very important human being. We should very often to learn each other from, you know, the past, the track we have already gone to both the experiences and the lessons. I'm sure China, uh, the government is willing to do better for the promoting environmental development, but still in the practice could be some problems. So how to improve? I think that's the work to be done by you guys from China, from Thailand, also from United Nations, and even including my organization, World Wildlife Fund. Thank you all for our excellent panel discussion. Let's give a big, uh, Applause to our panelists. And also thank you guys for the well, audience. Ex excuse me, there is a question there up there. We would have loved for China to the initiative, Dr. Wan, to look at it and uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. highlight something for us. I, I'm so sorry. Why don't you ask the question directly to the, to the panelists? You know, as a moderator, I have to stop here to follow our lunch break rules because the set event is waiting for us. I'm so sorry. Why don't ask them directly? Thank you very much. Yeah.
stand here, yeah? Yeah. Thank you.